God's word alone, where his perfect will is known. Our traditions shift like sand, while his truth forever stands. We will live by faith alone, clothed in merit not our own. All we claim is Jesus Christ and His finished sacrifice. Glory be, glory be to God alone. Through the church He redeemed and made His own. Has freed us, He will keep us till we're safely home. Glory be, glory be to God alone. Post Tenebras Lux After Darkness Light. All right. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Give me a one in the chat. Let me know I'm being heard. It's good to see you all. Good to see you, Breakfast Gun, Marion, JLR, Binet, Joey, Barocco Niner, Carm, Bible Care and Share Fellowship. All of you, good to see you. I see Binet is asking in the chat about the subscribers only thing. I've been doing that for a little while now, actually. Uh, and that doesn't exclude people from subscribing and commenting. It just cuts down on some of the uh, hit and run comments from people. So that means if one of the merit mongers, one of the Shamunians comes in here and wants to stick out their chest and tell us how many good works they've done today and how much God owes them, they have to at least sit through 10 minutes of the Bible before they uh, can leave their comment. So <laughs> that's the idea there. Uh, all right. Well, uh, first several announcements or reminders. The Our Strong Tower Conference is coming up. There will be several speakers involved in the conference. Some of them will be there in person like Samuel Green, myself, Hatun Tash, Dr. Edward Dalcor, and others will also be involved, like Dr. Tony Costa and Dr. Jay Smith. So there will be all sorts of lectures, uh, testimonies, panel discussions, workshops, and of course, there will be some debates. You already know, I think I mentioned this last broadcast and of course posted it on the community page that I will be debating Shadid Lewis on Isaiah 53. So we'll be debating the question, was Isaiah in fact predicting the person and work of Christ? Now, <laughs> some of you have uh, <laughs> sort of uh, scoffed at this in a sense, uh, you know, the idea is utterly, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a crazy thing to me, knowing that a text so clear would be a point of contention. But of course, if you're an unbeliever, you have to argue against a text like this. But I know from personal experience that just reading this text to Jewish people, for example, without telling them where it comes from, usually leads them to say, oh, that's about Jesus. We don't believe in Jesus. Then you tell them it's about, uh, it's, a, it's a prophecy written 700 years prior to Jesus, and their jaw usually hits the floor. Uh, but even more incredible is, uh, I, uh, I challenge Shadid to debate this topic, and then we asked Shadid what topic would he like to debate. So we, we agreed to debate Isaiah 53, but then open the door for Shadid to also propose a topic. And he actually chose <laughs> uh, John 1, 19 through 28, 
which is the text where the religious leaders come to John the Baptist and they say, are you Elijah? John says, no. They say, are you the prophet? John says, no. And finally, they say, are, are you the Christ? And John says, no, which then leads them to query, well, who then are you? You know, who do you think you are? What is this that you're doing? What authority do you have? And uh, Shadid thinks this is a prophecy about Muhammad. Now, technically speaking, it's not a prophecy at all. Uh, it's simply a series of questions that presuppose that there are these coming figures, namely Elijah the prophet and the Christ. The, the background to these questions are, or is the Old Testament, to prophetic statements in the Old Testament. Uh, but I, you know, the I, the basic idea for Shadid is because the religious leaders who question John presuppose a distinction between the prophet and the Christ. Therefore, the prophet is someone other than the Christ, and in Shadid's mind, that other figure is Muhammad. Now, there's some obvious problems with that. I won't uh, bother. Uh, enumerating them all now, <laughs> but but let's just say uh, there's some there's some real problems there. Uh, but but let me observe one problem. the uh, The background is obviously Deuteronomy 18. I don't think Shadid will uh, deny that. Uh, the background is Deuteronomy 18, where Moses said, "A prophet like me is going to come from among your brethren," and. Uh, Although the religious leaders presuppose a distinction between the prophet and the Christ, notice that they assume that the prophet would be a Jew. <laughs> They're certainly not assuming that he would be an Arab, right? They're Jews themselves. They came down from Jerusalem. They're going to John, a Jew who's baptizing Jews, and they're saying, are you the prophet? So they rightly understand on the basis of Deuteronomy 18 that the prophet like Moses from among their brethren would be an Israelite. So that, among other things, is a huge problem. But uh, what's interesting to me, at least at this point, is uh, how easy it was to organize these debates with Shadid. <laughs> uh, George, we were organizing the conference and originally I was going to do some lectures. I told George I'd like to debate. And George said, what do you like to debate? Who would you like to debate? And I said, let's, uh, uh, Shadid has been making some comments about Isaiah 53. So contact Shadid and see if you could set it up. And within a matter of days, Shadid and I already agreed to debate Isaiah 53. And then we asked him what topic he'd like to debate. And within a couple more days, he got back to us and we settled on John 1, 19 through 28. So uh, I, I had almost forgotten how easy it is uh, to organize a debate unless, unless you're talking about a Shemunian. <laughs> now, uh, notice this. Uh, so somebody sent me this comment uh, that they left on. So uh, Sam is very predictable. Um, Every time somebody sends him a message, an email, he falls apart and he publicly starts raving. And so somebody, I guess, sent him an email and he decided to start publicly posting a bunch of stuff again. Uh, and here he says, I, I repost this series of responses to Anthony Rogers. Notice he tags me again. He tags me knowing that all my comments are blocked. This is just a front. It's to make people think that uh, he's directly uh, coming at me, <laughs> right? Uh, but then he goes on, he says, since I received an email, which basically was a request to refute and expose the sham conference by Ministry to Muslims attacking and slandering the Catholic Church, uh, which, of course, is an apostate group. So it was an attack and slander. Rome anathematized the gospel at Trent. And so Rome uh, deserves to keep taking mortal blows to her head. Uh, but what was more interesting to me is the comment that's undoubtedly gone now, but somebody left a comment underneath it. I don't know if you can read that. I can barely see it. Uh, but Narrow Road said, it's been eight months since William agreed to debate, but won't show up. 
Big boy Sam here won't even do that. It's too deep waters for Sam. Sam is uh, in his head, believes Christ alone is not sufficient, yet is scared to debate the topic with Anthony. This reminds me of my childhood when I used to watch the cartoon called Courage the Cowardly Dog. <laughs> then uh, Sam said, uh, this shows why you're a dog like Anthony since William has been eating. Now listen to this. Since William has been emailing Anthony, first of all, William doesn't even have my email to my knowledge. He's never sent me an email, uh, but he has contacted me, but that's quite irrelevant. You'll see why. But he says, you're a dog like Anthony since William has been mailing, emailing Anthony to set up a debate for his destruction when uh, he will bury your demonic doctrines for all to see. So, so notice, this person said that Sam doesn't believe in the sufficiency, the sole sufficiency of Christ to save. Now, Sam retorts that William is going to destroy me defending the sole sufficiency of Christ as Savior, and bury your demonic doctrine. So according to Sam's retort here, the idea of Christ as all-sufficient to save is demonic, <laughs> right? So Sam is just breathing the same air and exhaling the same air as Rome in anathematizing the gospel. But he goes on, now, instead of waiting for your boyfriend to defend your demonic doctrines, be a man and defend them yourself. Skype uh, is open, Benny Malik on three, uh, Sam's famous Skype me uh, challenge. Uh, then the guy says, uh, you're like a child from fifth grade. You have no control over your anger. It's so easy to control your emotions. Why do you want to debate me? Are you saying you're too scared to debate Anthony? Just admit it. Anyway, we know the truth. Okay, but the, the more important thing here uh, that I want you to observe is not Sam's low character or anything like that. Uh, let you uh, decide that matter. But uh, it's the idea that William is, you know, trying to get this debate going. Okay, I already showed you last week uh, clear evidence that William is not at all trying to make this debate happen. Uh, so let me show you the latest. Now remember, <laughs> remember what I said before. William is a master at stalling. It's the, the one thing I'll give him credit for, which is not a positive commendation, but I, I do give him credit for being a master at stalling. What William does is when you message William, he waits several days before he responds. And when he responds, it's not a response, really. It's just him telling you that he's going to respond to you in a few days, right? It's already been a few days since he's reacted to what you said. And then after those few days, he says he's going to respond. And then when the few days comes, he doesn't respond. And then he starts the whole thing over again. I'm going to respond to you in a few days. It's the same thing over and over again. Uh, but let, let me show this to you. So I showed you part of this. I'm just going to go back uh, so you get the full scope of this. Um, but my lens, my lens, trying to debate Sam's champion who's going to destroy me and the quote-unquote demonic doctrine that Christ is all-sufficient to save. Um, let's see. I just need to... I'm trying to show you Messenger without showing you any personal details of William or anything like that. Um, okay, so I've got it enlarged here. All right, so here it is. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Marlon for days had been, uh, well, actually, let's go back. Um, William says on the 24th, I'm ready now. Let's work on a date. Just finished my last one and I've moved my next one a few months. Let's work on a date for that'll work for all of us. Then Marlon said, let's do it on Monday, the 27th of June. I said, that works for me, right? Then William says, that doesn't work for me. Full schedule next week as I prepare to fly out for Ger uh, Germany. <laughs> Does the day matter as in during the week or the weekend? So he had just said, okay, uh, schedule's opened up, cleared the table. Let's Let's get this debate rolling. Marlon proposes a date. I said it works for me. William says it doesn't work for him. So then Marlon proposes another date on June 24th. He says, if we can do July 8th at 8 p.m., would that work? I said, that works for me. 
June 25th, the next day, no response from William. June 25th, uh, later in the evening, uh, Marlon again says, William, let me know. I was able to move a debate up to move you guys in this spot. No response from William on the 25th, just like there was no response on the 24th. Then there's no response on the 26th. Uh, Marlon comes back and says, William, what you think? No response from William for three more days. June 30th, uh, Marlon says, William Albrecht, no response. And then I said, leave that poor guy alone. <laughs> I mean, it's obvious, right? Uh, then July 1st, uh, William says, this is my next debate on my schedule, but I have a major conference and multiple trips and deadlines, blah, blah, blah. Let's schedule this for August or September. As of now, my scheduled trip out of the... Okay, so he says he and his family have all caught COVID again. I think this is the second time. So uh, anyways, uh, so then Marlon says, okay, can we... Uh, this is July 10th. Can we do August 26th at 8 p.m.? And then I said, William will be busy. He plans on shaving that day or at least preparing in that day to shave the next day. And then uh, three days later, Marlon says, William Albrecht, trying to get his attention. The next day, William says, my family got COVID. I myself just recovered from it. I'll ring you up shortly so we can discuss some dates. That was July 14th. Five, uh, then Marlon says, okay, hoping you and your family will make a re full recovery. Five days later, William says, I'll message this group this weekend so we can set a definitive date. That was July 19th, right? Now Marlon says, okay, no problem. Then five days later, July 24th, uh, William, or Marlon says, William, are you ready to set the date? Then Marlon says, again, this debate is priority. I'll move a debate to get this one in. The sooner we can make the debate happen, the better. And the next day, no response from William. Uh, that, uh, that, then Marlon tags William again on the 25th. Then he tags him again on the 27th. Then he tags him again on the Thursday after that. And then <laughs> now uh, this would be last Friday. So William says, I just texted Anthony. I'm on vacation with my family. It might be late for him, but in several hours, once he's up, we'll text and iron out some details. So what William is referring to here is he sent me a text. I didn't respond to the text because I know William's antics. I want everything to be in one spot. So I reply here instead of through text, right? So Marlon says, okay, I'll message you guys in several hours once I wake in the morning. Then uh, later that day, Marlon says, let's set it up guys. And then I said in a text to me, William said, I will suggest tons of dates and let me know what works for you. Send it along. So I'm telling William, send it along. Okay. This is the Friday that William says he's going to send me a slew of dates that work for him. Uh, later that evening, Marlon tags, uh, William. And as you can see, I'm trying to scroll down further there has been nothing from William. It's now Wednesday, right? So, I mean, look at this. I mean, it, it's been, uh, I mean, we've been going at this since May, or, I mean, even longer, uh, trying to get this done. So, uh, Sam Shamoon, uh, <laughs> so either, either William is lying to his boss, Sam, and telling him that he's trying to set things up, or Sam is well aware that this isn't true and is lying on top of William's lie. Uh, and I don't get it. I mean, I'm happy to move on. If William doesn't want to debate, uh, that's fine. There are plenty of other people to debate. I've already agreed to debate Cabane, who's an Eastern Orthodox gentleman, because Perry Robinson farmed out the job. Sam didn't believe he could do it. He farmed it out to William. William uh, isn't willing to come forward and do it. Uh, Perry Robinson wasn't willing to do it. So he keeps pushing Cobain out there. Come on, get him Cobain. <laughs> Reminds me when I was a little kid and I used to get my brother in trouble. <laughs> uh, anyways. All right. Uh, all that is uh, what it is. Um, but just, just be sure I, I am trying to make this debate happen. Have tried. Uh, I've bent over backwards and uh, uh, thank you, by the way, Jack Ray. Good to see you. It's been a while. I mean, maybe you've been in the chat and I've missed your comments, but uh, thank you so much for that uh, coffee uh, sticker. <laughs>
And uh, thank you, Jamiro. Uh, Jamiro says, what's your take on Matthew's use of Isaiah 7, 14, presenting Jesus' birth as this fulfillment of this prophecy while non-Christians claim it isn't about Jesus at all? Shalom from Holland. Okay, so quickly, so I can get into these uh, slides for today's lesson. Um, one of the first things that Jews will say and others riding on their coattails is that the word in Hebrew just means a maiden. Now, a number of studies have been done showing that in the Hebrew scriptures, a maiden was considered a virgin unless there was evidence to the contrary. And it's quite evident contextually in Isaiah 7 that this girl is a virgin. Otherwise, it wouldn't function as a sign, right? In Isaiah 7, Ahaz is told, ask the Lord for a sign as high as heaven or as deep as Sheol. So he's saying, ask me for anything, however great, uh, to prove, to vouchsafe the truth of what I'm saying to you, right, in the, in the context of this prophecy. And Ahaz initially feigns piety and says, I won't put the Lord to the test. But the Lord had already told him, ask me, you know, test me in this. And so it's false piety on Ahaz's part. But then the Lord says, uh, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin shall conceive and bear a child, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, I, con so contextually, it's a virgin. There's, there's nothing monumental. Uh, there's nothing significatory that, it, right, God says, ask me for a sign as, you know, high as heaven or deep as Sheol in a woman conceiving. That happens all the time. It's been happening since the garden. Uh, so when when God says that this virgin or this woman's going to conceive, it, it's clearly a supernatural miracle. It's a supernatural wonder. When you look in the context, the, the broader context of Isaiah 7, this section is part of what's known as the Emmanuel, the scroll of Emmanuel. In fact, the name comes up again in chapter 8, the land of Israel is referred to as your land, O Emmanuel. So the land belongs to this one. So it's clearly not the prophet, uh, the prophet's child. It's not Isaiah's child. It's the one to whom the land of Israel belongs. He is its owner. And uh, then you get into chapter nine, where God says, uh, "Unto us a child is born; unto us a son." Is, or the prophet says, "Unto us a child is born; unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders, uh, and this is the name by which he'll be called: Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace." And then you get into chapter eleven. Actually, chapter ten. God Himself, Jehovah, is called the Mighty God, so it's a divine title. Chapter eleven, it says that a, a root shall. Uh, uh, a shoot shall come up from the, the uh, stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Talking about the Messiah, the spirit will rest upon him. So that's why it's called the, the scroll of Emmanuel. It's, it's thoroughly messianic. And this is also how it was understood by ancient Jews. So when contemporary Jews react against this and pretend like this is just some Christian innovation and it's contra Jewish, the fact is, ancient Jews understood this as the prediction of a virgin birth. It was Jews who translated the Septuagint or the Old Testament into Greek. And right there in the Greek text, it uses the word Parthenos in Greek, which can only mean virgin. Now, if you were to listen to somebody like Tovia Singer, you'll hear him say things like, you know, uh, Matthew uh, butchered the Hebrew, blah, 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 blah. Well, first of all, uh, Matthew compared to Tovia Singer, I mean, the idea that Tovia Singer is in a better position to know what this meant and how this was understood is just laughable. Tovia Singer is 21 centuries removed uh, from the time of Matthew. And, uh, you know, Matthew is a second temple Jew. And Matthew isn't even the one who's originating this understanding. It was already understood that way by the Jews who translated the Septuagint. So there, there's a lot more to say with respect to that prophecy, other arguments that are made against a messianic understanding. My recommendation would be to either get Michael Rydelnik's book, The Messianic Hope, or the Moody Handbook of Messianic Prophecy. Uh, the, the book by Rydelnik is smaller, uh, but still quite pungent. The book, The Moody Handbook, is much larger, like 1,500 pages, and includes 
articles from a whole host of scholars. So uh, that's what I would direct you to. And of course, there's there's other stuff you could read on Messianic prophecy. Hankstenberg, an old Lutheran dogmatician, is always good. Uh, Walter Kaiser has a book on the Messiah that's good that discusses it. Uh, there's the old classic. It's not so much a book on Messianic prophecy, but J. Gresham Machen wrote a book on the virgin birth of Christ in which he demonstrates that this is the correct understanding of Isaiah 4, uh, 7, 14. Uh, all right. All right. So let's get, well, let me just note these other super chats real quick. Thank you so much for that super sticker, Solitary Emmy. And thank you, Uriah Smith. Coffee on me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for refuting the merit mongering will worshipers. <laughs> All right, so today, I already knew when I got to Galatians 1.11, I hadn't put a whole lot of thought into it before sitting down to start preparing it, but I already knew once I got here that this was going to take me more than one session. And at, at this point, I don't even know how many sessions it might take. I, I don't want to overdo it, but... I can't miss the occasion to talk about uh, all sorts of things in connection with what's going to come up in Galatians 1, 11 and following. And I'll say more about that in a second. Uh, but let me share my screen. We're going to read the text. The, our focus is Galatians 1, 11 and 12. But we're going to read to the end of the chapter for the context. Paul says, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, another name for Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brothers or brother. Now, in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. All right. So we've already looked at the introduction, verses 1 through 5, which already involve Paul somewhat tipping his hand. A comparison of Paul's introductions in his epistles shows uh, that Paul was pretty consistent in how he opened up his epistles. And there are a number of points of contact between Galatians and those other epistles. However, there are also some marked differences, and, and we brought those out. Uh, the fact that Paul is so consistent makes these differences uh, stand out in bold relief. Paul, in his introduction, uh, says a number of things that already tell us there's, there's problems afoot in Galatia. In, in Galatians 1, 6 through 10, we see what the problem is. Apparently, a group of individuals whom I am loosely referring to as Judaizers, I say loosely because that term is not used for them in Galatians, but their teaching certainly matches that of those who are elsewhere called Judaizers. 
In fact, Paul in Galatians 2 is going to bring up an example of Judaizers, uh, an example of Peter's hypocrisy in the face of the presence of certain, certain Judaizers coming down into Antioch. Uh, as a way of getting into this issue. So they're obviously being used as a kind of foil for talking against the position of the men that are or have infiltrated the Galatian church. Okay, so Paul says these people have come in and they're preaching another gospel, which is really not another. That is to say, it's another in the sense that it's not Paul's gospel, right? It's not the apostolically authorized gospel that Paul preached to the Galatians, that gospel by which they were saved, that gospel through which they, in believing, received the Spirit by faith, not by works, and became children of Abraham, received the adoption of sons, and so forth. They were preaching something other than that, but Paul is quick to say it's not really another in the sense that it's not really good news. It's not the, the good news of Jesus Christ that Paul first proclaimed to them, and it isn't good news at all. And in fact, Paul says those who are preaching this other gospel are anathema. And he even makes it uh, evident for those that are familiar with the Old Testament, uh, which would have even been true, quite possibly, of these Galatians, because Remember, the Old Testament had been translated into Greek. And so uh, it, it's not as if only Jews would have recognized when Paul was picking up language from the Old Testament. Uh, otherwise, I mean, it, it would have made little sense for Paul to do that sort of thing so subtly. But it would have been too subtle. Uh, the points would have been too subtle for them to pick up if they weren't uh, familiar with this stuff from the Old Testament. But in any case, we, we are familiar with it and can look at that. And, and we see that when we look at Galatians 1, 6 through 10, the language that Paul used for the Judaizers it itself evokes the language used in the Old Covenant for the Baal worshipers, the false prophets of Baal, who were calling the Israelites away to the worship of Baal, right? The Baal worshipers were even uh, given to this idea uh, that they could placate their deity through self-mutilation, right? One of the things that Paul refers uh, calls the Judaizers or uh, the circumcision uh, are those mutilators of the flesh, right? So Paul, e even in uh, that language, is, is hearkening back to uh, the language used for the Baal worshipers in 1 Kings 18. So in Paul's mind, those who call people to another gospel are themselves idolaters. They're calling to idolatry. Likewise, Paul says those who are listening to this message, those who are in the process of departing from the gospel, right? Paul says, I, I, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for another gospel, right? That you are so quickly, Paul says, deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for another gospel. Just that statement by itself, even if we're not aware of its Old Testament background, indicates that departing from the gospel means departing from the living God. Paul says that they were deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for another gospel. Okay, but the language that you are so quickly deserting him who called you is used in Old Testament apostasy narratives, most notably in the incident of, of uh, worshiping the golden calf. Uh, in Exodus, it says that the people had quickly deserted or turned aside uh, to the worship of the golden calf. And so Paul hasn't minced words here. Paul has said the matter is just this serious. All those people who think this isn't a serious matter uh, aren't on the same page as Paul. You and Paul are, are not on the same page. In fact, I find it interesting that my old friend, uh, who himself abandoned this gospel, denies the soul sufficiency of Christ, pretends that his hero is Paul. <laughs> That's the last person that is the, that could be this man's hero. Paul anathematized those who wanted to add to the work of Christ their own decrepit works. Right, even. 
He even rejects the idea that you could add to the work of Christ those works that are done by believers, regenerate people in righteousness, right? Paul indicates that in numerous places. Uh, Philippians 3, for example, uh, or even Ephesians 2, right? When Paul says, uh, by grace you are saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul tells you here both positively and negatively how you're saved. You are saved by grace through faith, And that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it is by grace through faith, not of works. Paul then goes on and makes it clear that the kind of works he's talking about here can't be reduced to the works done by unregenerate people. Because uh, Paul goes on to say, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to walk in. So those who are saved by grace through faith apart from works are saved unto good works. Notice the order. Grace, faith, salvation, unto good works, right? So you're saved by grace through faith apart from works, but unto good works. The good works don't save, they follow salvation. And so you can't say the good works here can be limited to things like circumcision, uh, dietary restrictions, Uh, ceremonial ordinances, uh, you you simply can't do that in a text like Ephesians 2, because Paul says that God prepared for us good works for us to walk in, right after telling us we're not saved by works. And there's no qualifier there. He simply uses the term works. Um, So so this is the context. Uh, And then uh, Paul, at the conclusion of 6 through 10, says, am I now trying to please men or God? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. It's quite obvious that if Paul, although he would most certainly subordinate his own interests for the sake of communicating the gospel to others, right, which opens the door to certain unstable souls accusing Paul of being a man pleaser, Right. Although Paul was willing to subordinate his own interests for the sake of proclaiming the gospel to others, he was not willing to subordinate God's interests to the interests of men. Right. So in other words, if Paul was going to a place where they had certain customs and it would have been offensive for him to do certain things, and these were matters indifferent, they, they had nothing to do with uh, the gospel or what is right or wrong in the eyes of God, Uh, Paul would have been the first to adopt those customs. If I go to somebody's house and they have a custom that says you've got to remove your shoes, then I remove my shoes, right? And and that's all that Paul was getting at. He was a person of principle. He always says in those contexts, like 1 Corinthians 9, that when he subordinated his interests and he became all things to all men for the sake of Uh, of proclaiming the gospel, that it was for the sake of proclaiming the gospel. So it wasn't the gospel that Paul was paring down. He wasn't paring down the rough edges of the gospel to make it more palatable to unbelievers. That Paul was not willing to compromise on. And he's made it clear here in Galatians 1, 6 through 10, that he is no man pleaser, right? He has hurled anathemas at these merit mongers and said, they are anathema. They are under the curse, the divine curse curse. They are under the ban. They are devoted to destruction. That, that's the, the Old Testament background to that language that Paul uses. And he says that those who depart from this, who successfully depart from it, from their former profession, are themselves deserting the living God. Those aren't the words of a man pleaser. Moreover, it makes little sense to identify Paul as a man pleaser, knowing that Paul didn't seem to be uh, making friends and influencing people, (laughs) right? There were people who responded positively to his message, uh, but there were a great many people who didn't respond positively. And these were the people who wielded uh, power over Paul, uh, politically and physically speaking. These were the people uh, that were given to physical aggression and uh, were willing to uh, carry it out. Right. Even if they didn't have political authority, right, like the Jews, they, they were uh, in, in the mind of many Jews. Phinehas was like this paradigm example of godliness. Remember, Phinehas was the man who who ran in and killed the uh, Israelite who was uh, bringing a, 
uh, unbelieving woman into the camp of Israel and, and betting her in front of uh, uh, the people of Israel, which they weren't supposed to do. And Phinehas went in and, and killed him. And so a lot of Jews believe that this is uh, a justifiable thing and were willing to engage in that kind of activity, uh, which obviously in the case of Phinehas was justified, but without getting into the differences between why it was justified in the case of Phinehas and not in the case of others. Well, certainly the, the one main issue is that uh, the gospel is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And so it's not the case that those who are attacking, those who are purveying this message are in fact warring for God, right? That was Paul's mindset prior to his conversion. Uh, but but my point here is that, that Paul certainly wasn't gaining anything in terms of fame, in terms of power, in terms of wealth, in terms of uh, sex or women, all the sorts of things that usually motivate people to these uh, sorts of things. When, when you have cultists that start their own religion, uh, often these people, what they're trying to do is get a following around themselves, right? They, they want people to follow them and they want people to hold them up on a pedestal, right? That's one thing that they want. There, there are other things that, that motivate it. Uh, but a lot of times these people are narcissists, right? They're, they're, they're people who they would be content just to get the adulation of people, for people to fawn all over them, for people to think they're just the greatest thing going. Uh, but there are others that will certainly want to go beyond that. Joseph Smith, uh, Muhammad, uh, uh, Jim Jones, David Koresh, men of this sort all had ulterior motives that... Uh, were was fueling their uh, their their movements, right? All of them had an excess of women, uh, and in in other ways uh, were profiting off of godliness, not legitimate profit. Obviously, when people labor in spiritual matters, the, Paul says it's legitimate for them to be remunerated, uh, but there's a, a a legitimate way for them to be remunerated. And uh, there, there are certain uh, limits beyond which they aren't to go, and uh, all within the uh, guidelines of uh, biblical morality, right? So it's clear that, that Paul was not someone who was out for stature or any of these things. Uh, he wasn't simply trying to gain the clamor of people, uh, the accolades, an adulation of people. And if he was, it, it was an abysmal failure, right? And it would have been apparent to Paul. <laughs> I, I mean, so so Paul was converted shortly after uh, the resurrection and ascension of Christ. We read of Paul being present at the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7 and Acts 8. It says that he was uh, holding the coats of the men who stoned him, giving his approval. Uh, and he immediately went about trying to persecute Christians. Um, uh, Paul, uh, why did I bring that up? <laughs> um, well, yeah, yeah. So Paul was converted, uh, shortly after the resurrection and ascension of Christ. And, uh, even though Paul was not at any point, even prior to his conversion given to uh, some of the things that I was talking about. He was a zealous person, right? Paul has always stood out as a, a thorn in the side of unbelievers who want to say that the, the gospel that uh, Christians believe was made up, right? You, you have to account for somebody like Paul. Uh, Paul was a person, as he says here, that was advancing in Judaism. I know I'm not supposed to be getting into anything past verse 12, but I do just briefly want to uh, point out that Paul was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his contemporaries. So if Paul's motivations were simply to, uh, you know, gain uh, some kind of uh, fame and stature, uh, he already was on that trajectory, right? And after he becomes an apostle, if he thought that he was going to receive greater stature through 
preaching a different message, one that he made up, he quickly would have found out that's not the way things are going, right? Paul's converted a few years after the ascension of Christ, and yet Paul dies in AD 68 under Nero, right? So that's, uh, that's a, you know, a couple, over a couple of decades. And so Paul had to have known by then this isn't working out in that direction, if that were Paul's line of thinking. Um, but the, the, the reason that Paul is such a thorn in the side of unbelievers is you have to account for how a person like Paul, who was a Jew, who was zealous for the traditions of his people, would suddenly shift his outlook and begin proclaiming a message altogether foreign to what they thought at that time was the message of the prophets. Right? Paul was willing to hunt down and, and uh, cart off people to be killed, other Jews who believed this, uh, because he was zealous for the traditions of his fathers. What would lead somebody like Paul to begin proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was raised from the dead? Now, Understand that Paul's message is not merely that Jesus was raised from the dead, but that he was an eyewitness of Christ. And, and that's really what I'm going to focus on today. And what I said is going to take us into really uh, several shows on some of which will be something of an excursus. Uh, but I, I, I think it's fruitful to, to look into uh, Old Testament theophanies and the backgrounds for this, because uh, it'll show you something of the weightiness of what Paul is talking about here, something of what it entails with respect to the person of Christ, the work of Christ, and therefore the authoritative basis of this gospel that Paul was proclaiming, and therefore how it is so heinous that certain people would be opposing it. In opposing this gospel, these people are not merely opposing the word of a man, they are opposing the word of the risen and in fact, the uh, creator of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the the height of uh, the, the the heinousness of uh, what it is that people are doing when they oppose the gospel of justification by faith. Uh, so uh, let's see here. I already read the whole text. All right. Uh, now many people, okay. So if, when, when Paul says in verses 11 and 12, that the gospel that he preached is not according to man, right? This is already echoing things that he said before, but now Paul is going to get into this in some detail, but he's already broached this issue back in the first verse of the gospel. Remember when Paul introduces himself at the beginning of the epistle, at the insipid of the book. He says, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Okay? What Paul has done here is he's, he's set up certain contrasts. Okay? There are two ways that Paul could have arrived at this idea that he's supposed to proclaim this message. It could have either been something that came to him from men, that is, its authority is from men, it's of human origin, right? Men are the ones who arrived at this idea, right? Maybe through philosophical speculation uh, or through some other means of uh, human investigation. This position was arrived at, and then these people persuaded Paul of its truth and now Paul is prom promulgating what these men persuaded him of. Paul's saying that's not the case. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men. His authority is not of human origin. But Paul also says it's not through man. Okay? There is a legitimate authority that people have that is of divine origin, but it comes through men, right? So, the office of an elder in the church is an office of authority. Elders have real authority from Christ, right? They are elders or leaders in Christ's church. They exercise authority. 
They exercise Christ's authority. They act on his behalf. Doesn't mean they're infallible. Doesn't mean they're impeccable, but they have real authority, right? They're also under Christ as, as head of the church, so they're obligated to do what he says, but they have real authority. But that authority is conferred on them from Christ through men, right? Whenever you uh, uh, see an elder, biblically speaking, you're seeing a man who was ordained through the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Okay, that's what Paul says to, uh, to Timothy. He tells him, remember, you know, you were, you were ordained by the laying on of hands through the presbytery. The word presbytery is the word for elders. And uh, that's where, so for example, a Presbyterian church is called a Presbyterian church because uh, uh, the, 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 the structure of, of church government in a Presbyterian church is that it's governed by a plurality of elders. There's no pope at the top. Right. There, there's not a pope, cardinals, bishops, you know, and, and so on. This hierarchical pyramidic uh, structure. Uh, the only head of the church is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who died and rose again. We are his body. He is the head. So Christ is the only head of the church and he rules and governs it through elders. Not one man, but a plurality of elders. This prevents one man uh, from, you know, letting it get to his head and uh, becoming a tyrant. Uh, now, there are other churches that have an elder-governed structure. I don't mean to suggest only Presbyterians do, uh, but they may not use Presbyterian as the name for their movement, right? But that, that's just to explain why Presbyterians use that term. Uh, it, it, it distinguishes it, say, for example, from the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church has what's called an Episcopalian form of government. An Episcopalian form of government is very much like the Roman form of government. Even though the Episcopal Church broke off from the Roman Church, they have a similar church structure, even if different doctrines, right? Though uh, in some ways people will say that it's sort of a halfway house between Rome and uh, full-blown Protestantism. But in any case, uh, they have an Episcopal structure, right? Uh, uh, Episcopal, I don't want to get into a whole thing on uh uh, ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church and, and church government, but uh, the word presbyteros for elder is used in the Bible, and the word episkopos is used in the Bible. But in the Bible, presbyteros and episkopos are interchangeable terms. Okay, One is the name for the office, the other is the name for the function exercised by those who have that office. Okay, Episkopos little, literally means an overseer. It's often translated bishop. Right. So what happened in the Episcopal Church and in the Roman Church is they separated out two titles that are used interchangeably and turned them into separate separate offices and made one of those offices superior to uh, other offices that are subordinate to that uh, to that office. Uh, but in Scripture, that's not true. And it's also not true in some of the earliest post apostolic writings. If you look at Clement and others, it's not an Episcopal structure. All right. But the point is here that Paul says that. His authority is not of human origin. It doesn't originate with men, but it's also not something that was conferred on him through men. Okay, that's what Paul says in verse one. That's the first contrast. It's not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. But the other contrast there is, in the very nature of the case, one between mere men and Christ, right? Christ is distinguished from mere men and identified with, put on an equality with God the Father. Okay, that already shows the exalted nature of Christ. Christ is not a mere man. He certainly is a man. Paul says that he's he was raised from the dead by God the Father. That presupposes his real humanity. But he's no mere man. Uh, and therefore, the authority that Paul had from Christ is divine authority. Okay, so Paul says that in a very terse manner, pithy but yet pungent manner in verse 1. Now he begins to get into it in, in greater detail. It was this fact that Paul had authority directly from Christ that revolutionized everything for Paul. It was this that brought about Paul's change, Paul's conversion, and brought about his uh, apostolic activity. It was that in that conversion that Paul was also called to be an apostle of Christ. Okay? So that's what Paul's referring to here in verse 11 
when he says, I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. It's not from men. I didn't get my authority from them. I didn't get my gospel from them. Okay? I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. Okay? I didn't get it from anyone. Nobody taught it to me. I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? What is this revelation of Jesus Christ that Paul is talking about? What is this revelation of Jesus Christ that caused Paul to go from a zealous persecutor of the church who was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his contemporaries, what is it that caused him to go from that to a person who would proclaim Christ even though it meant the loss of all things for Paul? Right. Remember how Paul has this whole laundry list of things that he endured for the sake of Christ. Uh, he was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he went hungry, he was uh, naked, he was in peril from his own countrymen, from others, he was brought before kings and governors. All these things happened to Paul, put on house arrest, chained between guards, all for the sake of uh, proclaiming this message. And why? Because he received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. This encounter with Christ was so powerful that it brought about this change. That's what I was talking about before when I said that Paul is a thorn in the side of unbelievers. They have to account for what would make this man change his position. He wasn't just saying that he believed this gospel, but that he himself was a witness of the risen Christ. There's a distinct difference between a person coming to believe something, they, they're persuaded of it, which is legitimate if, if the rationale for believing it is true, which we all believe the gospel on the basis of the testimony of the apostles, the fulfillment of prophecy, the prophetic witness, and so forth. That's all legitimate, right? If, if from uh, men of authority that conferred on them by God, uh, that were attested to by God with signs, uh, men who uh, are proclaiming the fulfillment of the prophetic scriptures, all those sorts of things. It's legitimate to believe on the basis of their testimony. But Paul is not merely doing what he, or wasn't merely doing what he did because he had become persuaded of something. He was proclaiming that he had seen, he had an encounter with the risen Christ. Okay? It's one thing for a person to be persuaded of something that's true, it's another for, uh, and be willing to die for it. It's another for them to be willing to die for something that they said they saw if they knew they didn't really see it. This puts off the table the idea that Paul was simply lying. Okay? When people lie, there's a motive for it, right? Generally speaking, <laughs> you, you, you don't lie because you think it's going to make things worse for you. You lie because you think it's going to make things easier. And uh, when a person lies, thinking that it's to their advantage, once they learn it's not to their advantage, they begin squealing like a pig, right? Uh, so one, one of the things I like watching are these uh, uh, documentaries of old mafia people. And uh, it's interesting to think of the, the mob back in uh, much earlier times when it was mostly confined to particular families where therefore the the loyalty was high because if somebody turned they were turning on a family member and that would not only affect that family member but other family members but as as things progressed in the history of the mob other people from outside the family the bloodlines would come in and loyalty and, and other things happened there were there were people that uh were, were more and more um willing to uh, give up people, right? Especially if they were on the line and if they heard that somebody had turned on them. And uh, so uh, I don't know if you, got, if you guys have seen, there's, there's a bunch of videos by Sammy the Bull. Sammy the Bull uh, turned on John Gotti, the Teflon Don. Uh, there, there's a bunch of other stuff, uh, you know, online. But, but the point there is that here's men, they're willing to lie as long as it's to their advantage. But once they're in a position where this is disadvantageous to them. Then people begin, you know, opening their mouth and saying, okay, I made it all up. It's quite evident that Paul wasn't lying. Now, the other option is that Paul was simply making this up, uh, or excuse me, uh, th that would be Paul lying. But the other option is to say that Paul imagined this. It was fictitious. Uh, it was, uh, just a hallucination or what have you. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, 
But the one thing you can't say is that Paul was a liar, right? That that doesn't fly. Um, but, uh, oh, the thing I wanted to say is, <clears throat> sorry, um, when you think about Paul's encounter with Christ, there are three places where we're given this in detail, okay? and each, each place gives some additional details, uh, but there are three places where we have the account of Paul's encounter with Christ. They're given to us by Luke in the book of Acts, Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. The first account is Luke's third-hand account, so Luke recounts it in, in uh, the third person. He says, you know, Paul went here and did this, Paul went there and did that. The next two accounts, Acts 22 and Acts 26, are Luke's recording of Paul giving the account in the first person. Okay, so uh, you have these three accounts of Paul's encounter with Christ. And when you read these accounts and you think of how Paul would have understood them as a Jew, it should be obvious that as a Jew, <clears throat> the immediate thought that would be in Paul's mind, you know, he's not a pagan, right? He, he's not a Gentile. He's certainly not a Muslim, right? Islam didn't even exist, right? Uh, the false prophet of Islam was not yet a sparkle in his father's eye. He's certainly not thinking like a Muslim or even a post-Christian apostate Jew who is disinclined from believing that it was possible for God to appear to people. Okay, Now, with Muslims and with post-Christian apostate Jews, we agree that God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Now, I think that in Islam, that's not actually what Muhammad taught. I think that's what developed among some groups of Muslims. That's what you'll hear from some Muslims. I don't think Muhammad had that uh, view of God, uh, and I've talked about that on other occasions. I think Muhammad had a very anthropomorphic conception of his deity, uh, but the, the, the classical view of Muslims, as well as the view of apostate Jews after the time of Christ, for them, the whole notion of God appearing is anathema. It, it's not believed to be possible that the infinite God could reveal himself in a palpable way to his creatures. Now, anybody who's familiar with the Old Testament and Second Temple Judaism knows that was not the view of Jews in the first century. And how could it be? in light of the Old Testament. Now, you might say, well, aren't Jews today uh, going by the Old Testament? No, they're, they're primarily governed by the Talmud. I, I've actually had Jews that I've spoken with directly and almost forthrightly contradict the text of Scripture when I've shown them occasions of God appearing. Okay, take, for example, the very mundane appearance of God in Genesis 18. I say mundane because other examples of God appearing are altogether glorious and magnanimous and so forth. Uh, or, uh, you know, the, the descriptions are exalted and awesome and so forth. And we're going to talk about some of those. Uh, but in Genesis 18, you have this very mundane appearance of God. Uh, it says that uh, the Lord appeared to Abram near, near the oaks of Mamre. Abraham, you know, looked up and he saw three men. Okay, so this is what Abraham initially knows. He sees three men that approach him. We find out in the course of the narrative that one of those men is the Lord, and then the other two depart from Abram and the Lord and go down into Sodom, and they're identified as angels. Now, some Christians, Augustine, others, have argued that this is actually all three persons of the Trinity, that's not my view. I just put, put it out there so that you're aware of that. But one thing that's painfully clear from the text is that the figure that remained with Abram was the Lord. The, the text is explicit. 
I've shown this text to Jewish people, and I had a uh, a number of Jews tell me uh, that that can't be the Lord because God made a covenant with Israel at Sinai, and he told them they're not to make any image of God, uh, and no image of God was seen. And uh, uh, the Talmud tells us that, uh, you know, God can't be seen and so forth, right? So th this, that's what this guy's telling me. So for him, the Talmud was all, uh, it was overarching in its authority. Doesn't matter what the text of scripture says. They, through oral tradition, have this understanding of the covenant uh, making event at Sinai, which precluded a vision of God. And therefore, God can't be seen, hasn't been seen, uh, and, and won't be seen. Even though Genesis 18 says he was seen, right? Now, I should quickly say, since I've said that God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, that what this entails when it speaks of God appearing is that God has voluntarily condescended which is the very thing that's involved in the temple system, right? When God instructed uh, Moses to build the tabernacle, and then later Solomon proceeded to build a more permanent structure for the Lord, uh, the, the rationale for it was so that God could dwell in the midst of his people. It was basically a renewal of the Edenic conditions that Adam and Eve have had. Right. God dwelt among them. So God is reestablishing this with Israel. Only Israel is now sinful. So it requires uh, some limitations to their experience of this presence of God. Uh, so God dwells in the uh, inner sanctum of the tabernacle and temple. And only the preach, uh, priest could enter in and only with the blood of atonement and only once a year. Right. But God is still dwelling in their midst. Well, when Solomon constructed the temple, Solomon marveled as great as the temple was. It took seven years to build it. And, uh, you know, incredible number of men, man hours, materials, even as great as the temple was, Solomon marveled in first Corinthians or first Kings eight. And he says, will you indeed dwell on earth right in, in with men in this temple? He says, even the heavens, the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Right. Nevertheless, as Solomon concedes and as the events tell us, God did come and dwell in the temple. OK, so in some way, God is able, the eternal, ineffable, immutable, transcendent God is able to dwell in the midst of his people without it circumscribing him, limiting him, constraining him. OK, and this then becomes a anticipation of what would be realized in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like God appeared in human form to Abraham and then dwelt or tabernacled among his people, so Jesus, as the full realization of that, actually becomes flesh and tabernacles among us, according to the New Testament. Well, uh, so we, we have, uh, uh, for, for Paul as a Jew, it's, well understood that God was able to appear to people. In fact, Paul would have known from the Old Testament that when God called the prophets, it was God himself who immediately called them. Okay? Now, prophets could receive revelations in various ways, through visions, through dreams, uh, through angelic visitors, but the calling of a prophet was always direct and immediate. It didn't always necessarily involve a visible appearance of God, but certainly an audible communication to the prophet. Whenever we're given the call narrative of a prophet in the Old Testament, we're not always given the call narrative of a prophet. We're just introduced to a prophet. We know that he's a prophet uh, and uh, so forth. But in some cases, we're actually given the call narrative. The moment when God calls a person to be a prophet. And in every case, it's a, a direct encounter with God. And so as a classic example, when Moses is called to be a prophet and to lead Israel out of Egypt, it's God who does so from the burning bush, right? Exodus 3 tells us that God appeared to Moses. 
right? Moses was afraid to look at God. Moses asked, what is your name that I may say to the children of Israel who sent me? God says, I am who I am. Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So it was God who appeared to Moses and called him to be a prophet. Likewise, it was God who appeared to Isaiah. Remember, Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, right? The train of his robe filled the temple. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about how the, the, the angels around the throne are crying out day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. And I, uh, Isaiah, just like Moses, is undone by this encounter, right? Moses is afraid to look at God and Isaiah says, woe is me, I am undone, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Uh, but then uh, God signifies that his sins have been atoned for, and he appoints Isaiah to be a prophet. So these are two examples of a call narrative in the Old Testament, a direct encounter with God. Now, one of the reasons for this why the, the person would be directly called by God. First of all, you know, sometimes people will say, how do I know if it's God speaking to me? Well, the, the nature of these appearances of God was such that no doubt was left in their minds, right? And this was a necessary thing in order to prepare them for the work they were about to embark on. In order for Moses to go and try and effect the deliverance of six million slaves, from Egypt, the greatest superpower on earth at that time, right? How are you going to take a bunch of slaves out of a nation that is a, a powerful nation with trained and armed men? How are you going to accomplish that, right? Moses had been a shepherd in the desert for 40 years. And before that, he lived uh, the life of a prince in, the, in, in Pharaoh's palace. So how is he going to pull this off? He had to be assured that what he was doing was not uh, something uh, that he just got the bright idea to do or that somebody else had passed on to him. He had to be sure that what he was doing was backed by God himself. Okay? The same thing was true for Isaiah. God told Isaiah, I'm sending you to this people. Uh, and he says, say to them, be you ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding. In other words, these people are going to have eyes that are covered over, ears that are stopped up. They're not going to hear you. You're going to preach to them, and it's going to fall on deaf ears. Okay, They're still going to hold tightly to their false beliefs in spite of how patently false you make it uh, evident to them. Right, and, and so Isaiah was going to experience great opposition. So this is part of the significance or importance and necessity of a prophetic call being uh, the, uh, through uh, direct divine encounter. Well, th these are the sorts of things that would have been in the background of Paul's thinking. In fact, when we look at certain call narratives, we can actually see that Paul is picking up the language of some of these call narratives. L listen to what Jeremiah 1 says, Jeremiah 1 says, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, notice it's the word that came to Jeremiah and spoke, right? The word came saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, okay? And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, when Paul, remember what Paul said, uh, you go back to uh, Acts or Galatians 1, sorry. In verse 16, he says, uh, or verse 15, he says, uh, he called me through his grace, or, or well, actually, verse 15. When God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb. Now, literally what Paul says is when God, ha who had set me apart, even from my mother's belly, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, and so on. Paul says that, that God set him apart even from his mother's belly. Well, if you look at the Septuagint of Jeremiah 1, that's how it's translated. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. So the very language that Paul uses to talk about this encounter with the risen Christ 
is itself picked up from one of the Old Testament call narratives, the calling of Jeremiah. Okay, now I, I could also show some points of similarity between uh, the call of Paul and Isaiah, but I'm going to skip that for right now. Um, and actually, I'm going to skip. Well, actually, let me show you this before getting into these other things. It's about to get uh, really good, <laughs> if it wasn't already. <laughs> uh, at least it. At least this excites me. Uh, but uh, here's another example. I just want to make it clear that uh, Paul rested his authority on this claim that he had seen the risen Christ. To the Corinthians, who were being tempted to uh, engage in a kind of party spirit, right? One says, I follow Cephas, another Apollo, and so forth. Uh, Paul Paul makes it clear that he's an apostle and uh uh, he says in verse one, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? And what he's talking about here is, you know, the other apostles had exercised certain liberty and some people were, were coming down on Paul, uh, even though Paul himself was not taking advantage of those liberties that the other apostles had. For example, Peter had a wife. Uh, other apostles were re uh, remunerated. They received support for their gospel labors. Uh, but Paul forewent all of, for, you know, he, he didn't uh, take advantage of those sorts of things. He didn't have a wife. He didn't get paid. He worked with his own hands. But he says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. So in other words, if to others I'm not an apostle, meaning not recognized as such, at least I am to you. You know it. You know that I'm apostle because you yourselves are the seal of my apostleship. Right? It was through my proclamation of the gospel that you came to be in Christ. God was at work through me among you. And so you yourselves are testimonies, evidences of my apostleship. Right? And Paul here rests this authority on his uh, seeing of the Lord Jesus. Okay. Now, a classic text in the same epistle where Paul speaks of himself as one who viewed Christ, again, connecting it to his gospel preaching. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, listen to this, those of you who are downplaying the importance of the gospel, again, the people that keep saying this is not a matter to be pressed, since what's more important is combating those who make no profession of faith in Christ. Uh, the gospel is all important, according to Paul. If people profess Christ but don't affirm this gospel, it's, it's, it's not, according to Paul, an indifferent matter. Paul says in verse 3, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Paul says this is of first importance. That's why he could say all the way back in 1 Corinthians 2, in light of all the turmoil that was uh, going, you know, all the stuff that was happening in Corinth that, that needed a, being a, to be addressed, Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. This is the most important issue, right? And it's a failure to properly understand this that gives rise to all these sorts of things that you're engaging in. Now, one of the things that shows us, by the way, is it, there, it's possible, on the one hand, to deny the gospel outright. You can say you don't believe the gospel. You could say uh, you could claim to believe the gospel, but really be affirming something else, such as the necessity of your own merit uh, or whatever it might be. Uh, there's denying the gospel in that sense, but there's also a sense in which people can live out of accord with the gospel. And what that takes then in order for it to be remedied is a clear presentation of the gospel and then an application of it to these issues. 
Okay, so Paul's not saying these people have outwardly or uh, explicitly denied the gospel or, or theoretically denied the gospel, but that there are problems in Corinth, and the, the remedy for them is, is to proclaim Christ to them all over again and make application of that to these particular issues. Okay, but Paul says this gospel is of first importance. Okay, He says he received it. He says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Now, I mentioned before that there were two possibilities at least, uh, two at least that I'm going to address now, uh, that one could try to use to explain Paul's conversion and gospel proclamation. You could either say Paul was lying, or you could say that he imagined it. It's evident that Paul wasn't lying. You, you've got a huge mountain to surmount if you want to say that Paul was lying. But it also doesn't work to say that Paul was simply making this up, right? And this has been pointed out by people. I, I'm probably not saying anything new here to anybody, uh, but I will say it in case there's somebody here who hasn't heard it. But Paul, when Paul speaks of seeing the risen Christ, he's talking about an experience with the risen Christ that other people had on other occasions. So it wasn't distinctive to Paul. Moreover, it's an experience that people had who were disinclined to believe it. It's not just that people who wanted this to be true thought they saw Jesus, right? You might imagine Peter uh, and the other apostles wanting to believe that Jesus was alive and therefore wanting to see this, but Paul was certainly not desirous of seeing this. Neither was James. The James uh, mentioned here uh, is likely and most ordinarily understood to be James, the Lord's brother. Um, remember, James, as one of Christ's brothers, didn't believe in him. You, you can read about that in, in John 7. So James at first didn't believe in him. So you have to account for why somebody like James, who didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah, and Paul came to believe in Jesus. But you also have to account for why Paul can say here that Jesus appeared to the 12, so a whole group of people, a dozen people, and appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. In the nature of the case, hallucinations are uh, not extra mental, right? They're, they're subjective to the individual. If I am hallucinating or imagining something, it's not something that you too see. Right, a, a hallucination by definition, a, or you know, somebody imagining something is subjective. It's internal to the individual. It's not an objective reality, and therefore a shared experience. Paul is saying that twelve people saw him at once, five hundred people saw him at once, and uh, he's and he's able to say, most of whom remain until now. What what Paul is saying is. You can go and ask these people, okay? There were groups of people who saw Jesus, and many of them are still alive. Now, it's interesting. I, I was recently doing work for David, and uh, I was doing something on the authenticity and reliability of the Bible, which, by the way, for my Patreon supporters, I'm going to... Uh, I, I did something for David, but I, I then took that same thing and I, I'm like enlarging it and turning, turning it into something bigger. Uh, 
for a different purpose. David has one purpose for it. I have a, a different purpose, but I'm going to release that on Patreon uh, on the authenticity and reliability of the Bible. But um, uh, one of the things that I was I'm pointing out in the article, just one of many things, is that the writings of Paul, for as much as they are attacked by people, they are among the best attested books of antiquity. I, the, among the best attested books of anything in antiquity. Right? I, I'm talking about the fact that Paul authored them. I'm talking about uh, people referring to them. Uh, there, there's nothing better in antiquity that I can think of than Paul's writings. Okay, so In fact, one of the writings of Paul that is so well attested is 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, uh, e even uh, liberal scholars will not deny that this was written by the Apostle Paul, right? In fact, liberal scholars, 21 centuries removed from some of the evidence, we still have a bunch of evidence, but 21 re centuries removed from some of the evidence that people in earlier times had who attested to Paul, they still can't, on the basis of surviving evidence, with all the skepticism they want to muster, they still can't bring themselves to doubt at least seven of Paul's epistles. Okay, Now, the others are easily defensible as well. They're just uh, exercising extreme prejudice against the others when they, when they try and attack them. But the evidence is so strong for Paul that even skeptics, radical skeptics, even skeptics who deny that Jesus existed, <laughs> they, they won't deny that Paul wrote these things. And uh, 1 Corinthians among them is, fact, in fact, not just among them, but probably stands out from them as the best attested of the best attested books of antiquity. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 was the, the, the general dates for 1 Corinthians 15 are 80, 52 to 54. You know, scholars uh, will debate a little bit the the specific date, but they, they've narrowed it down. It, it's not possible that it could have been written later, uh, and it's not likely that it was written before it. There are certain indicators uh, on the basis of the internal and external evidence that narrow it down to that window. So this means that we're looking at a book that was written extremely early in the history of Christianity, and it's among one of the best attested books. But I bring this up because here's Paul in this extremely early, well-attested book who's saying, I saw Jesus, so did these other men that I've named, right? Cephas, James, the 12, and over 500 people, right? Uh, he, he obviously doesn't give a list of 500 people, but uh, there's probably a footnote uh, there saying, you, you want to know their names, ask me. Um, but he's able to say this without fear of being contradicted. Okay? Paul could say this in the, the 50s, confident that anybody who wanted to could have checked these things out and could have confirmed that what Paul is saying is, in fact, the case. Okay, so... Uh, what I want to do is quickly, I said it's about to get good. Uh, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> but uh, maybe maybe I'll take a, a break here for just a second and see what's going on here in the chat. Um, all right. Let me catch some of these super chats. Like I said, people, don't tune, tune out now. This is where it's about to get extremely good. Um, catch these super chats. I already got Urea. Thank you again, Urea, for the coffee. Uh, and Mason O says, thank you for your hard labor in the gospel. I've listened to tens of hours of your vids. I'll pick this one up later. You've been a blessing, man, and you shall reap your rewards. Thank you so much, Mason. Uh, thank you for the, the super chat. Uh, thank you for the reminder that this is a blessing to you. Uh, it's uh, a blessing to talk to people about these things. Uh, obviously, I have personal and family needs and so forth, so it's also a blessing to be uh, supported by people, but uh, I do this for free, 
and uh, your reminder is, is sufficient to me. Uh, but I thank you. you. You helped me make this something I can do more often when you support. So thank you, Binet. Uh, Binet says, interesting contrast between how Paul was chosen compared to Matthias. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, Matthias was chosen by Lot, and Paul had a direct encounter with Christ. All right, did I miss anything? Okay, here's uh, Germond. Keep giving us the truth of God. Thank you so much, Germond. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Notomo. Thank you, Notomo, for no comment, but for the, the little super chat. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Corinth Chandler, for that. Again, you guys are a blessing. Um, all right. So Islam on trial says, uh, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Good to see you, too. All right. Uh, yeah, so Bible Care and Fair Fellowship says, people won't live a life of persecution due to a lie. Yeah, I mean, th th there are crazies out there, right? But uh, generally speaking, uh, generally speaking, when when people lie and do certain things, there there's some reason they think it's going to benefit them. Right now, a person can become can become such a practiced liar that they just lie all the time, <laughs> right? But when we're talking about something that they're they're proclaiming as this all important core conviction and so forth, uh, even in their cases, it's altogether unexpected that you, you'd find this sort of thing. Um, all right. So uh, all right. So let's get let's get back into this because I don't know how much longer it's going to take me to to do this. And like I said, this is only part one, but I do have to get through this material at least in order for this not to be a five to ten part uh, <laughs> uh, series of lectures. All right, so what I want to do now quickly is just look at some of the features that we're told about in uh, Paul's Damascus Road encounter. Okay, so remember I said these are found in Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. And for Paul, as a first century Jew, the context within which he would have understood this are Old Testament theophanies, Old Testament call narratives. And Paul even uses the language, at least of Jeremiah, uh, to explain his own calling, his own encounter with the risen Christ, his own encounter with the word, right? The Logos, the Lord Jesus, just like the word appeared to Jeremiah. Paul identifies Jesus as uh, the one who appeared to him. And he uses the language of Jeremiah to uh, to express that. Uh, but but Jeremiah's call narrative is not the one that's immediately in the background of Paul's conversion. There's actually a theophanic encounter, a call narrative that has a remarkable course uh, series of correspondences uh, with Paul's experience. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing just for a moment because I want you guys to put your votes in. Okay. <laughs> just, just take a guess here. If you had to guess it, given what you understand, and by the way, good to see you too, Apologia Center. Uh, but if you had to guess in light of your knowledge of Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26, the three places that tell us about Paul's encounter with the risen Christ. If you had to guess what Old Testament theophanic encounter and call narrative is most similar to what we see in the case of Paul, what would be your guess? And I don't know why my camera got blurry here. Hey, now it's worse. <laughs> Hold on. Let me see if I can fix that. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just on my end, but... Um, aha, there we go. All right. So do we have anybody guessing here? 
Do we have anybody guessing? For some reason, I don't see the chat moving. Oh, there we go. Aha, Zira. Man, the first person. The first person to guess says Ezekiel. Now, remember, now people are going to give several different examples. Uh, the theophanies of the Old Testament are very similar to each other in certain ways. So it's not as if pulling out any theophany would be wrong. So when people say Moses or, or uh, other examples, it's not that I'm saying these aren't in some sense in the background. But there is a particular ex uh, encounter that it's quite obviously the main one that is is in the background when uh, it uh, when Paul's encounter is being explained. So we're going to look first at. Um, I mean, next week uh, I'll read the whole of one of these accounts. But right now, I'm just going to show you some of the features of these accounts, drawing from all three of these uh, chapters. So first is the timing when this occurred. According to Acts 22, it was about noontime. Okay, so around noon. In Acts 26, it says at midday. So the, the timing is in that vicinity, right? Uh, during midday. Now, you'll see why that's significant, um, at least one of the reasons why that's significant today. Uh, but the first reason it's significant is in light of the visual description of this event. Okay, We're told in Acts 9, suddenly a light flashed from heaven, or a light from heaven flashed around him. Okay, in order for a light to flash around Paul at midday, this light had to be more brilliant than the light of the sun, at least as it's uh, uh, being experienced on earth, right? So already in Acts 9, we, we have something of an indication of the brilliance of this experience. Okay, Paul said, or Luke tells us, a light from heaven flashed around him, and it was sudden. Right, so Paul is suddenly arrested by this light flashing from heaven. In Acts 22, it modifies it by saying, "A very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me." Okay, so now we're told that it was not just a light, but a very bright light, as if that wasn't already apparent from chapter nine. But in Acts 26, most descriptive of all, this is. A first-hand account from Paul. I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. So here we have this additional detail that the light that flashed around Paul also flashed around or was shining all around Paul and those who were journeying with him. Okay, We're going to learn in a moment that while they all had some measure of experience of the light, only Paul was permitted uh, in this experience to uh, actually see Jesus and understand the words of Christ. Okay, so the people that are with him see the light and hear sound, but they can't discern the figure or uh, understand, make intelligible the words, okay? So here's the oral description, meaning what was heard. Uh, we're told that in verse or chapter 9 that Paul fell to the ground and heard a voice. So we're also told that Paul fell to the ground. Uh, 22.7, Paul says, I fell to the ground and heard a voice. Uh, 26.14, Paul says, when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me. So again, uh, in chapter 26, you have this addition that it wasn't just Paul who saw the light and fell to the ground, but it was those who were with him who saw the light and fell to the ground as well. Okay. Then in verse 7, chapter 9, we're told the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Okay? The implication here is that they did not see Christ, though they knew that something was happening. 
There was this brilliant light flashing all around them. It strikes them dumb. They're speechless. And they hear something, but they don't see the one that's making the noise, right? Then Acts 22, 9 says, those who were with me saw the light to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. All right. In chapter 9, verse 8, it says, Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. Now, this, together with what we just saw and something we'll see in a moment, reinforces the idea that Paul saw the Lord Jesus, right? Before, he makes it clear that those who were with him saw the light but didn't see anyone, and the suggestion is Paul did. Here, we're told that Paul, as a result of this encounter, is blinded, right? So the others who aren't permitted to see Christ are not blinded. Paul was, okay? So I'm suggesting here that this uh, tends to the idea that Paul literally saw Jesus, okay? And then 2211 says, I could not see because of the brightness of that light. Okay, so here we're told that Paul heard and saw more. In chapter 9, verse 17, it says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So this is what Ananias is saying to Paul. Remember, after Paul gets up, he's led by the men to Ananias. And Ananias has heard from the Lord Jesus in a vision and was told that Saul is coming to him and, and so forth. And so Ananias is saying to Paul, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, notice he says, Brother Saul. <laughs> Isn't that remarkable? The, the last time this man, Ananias, had heard of Saul was of Saul as a persecutor of the church, so a destroyer of the church. In fact, when Jesus speaks to Ananias and tells him Saul's coming to him, Ananias immediately protests and says, Lord, he, he, he's persecuting your people and so forth. But the Lord tells him that he has appointed Paul to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And so what does Ananias do? Immediately, he, he is filled with affection for Paul. By virtue of the fact that Paul now belongs to Jesus, Ananias goes from thinking of Paul as an enemy and somebody to be uh, wary of to thinking of Paul as a brother. Okay? This is a mark of faith. Okay? That's why 1 John tells us that anyone who does not love the brethren is not a believer. Okay? It doesn't mean believers can't sometimes uh, get upset with each other. We can sin against each other. Matthew 18 is all about that. Uh, we need to repent when we do and, and accept correction and so forth. Uh, but the fundamental uh, attitude and heart, the direction of our hearts towards other believers ought to be one of brotherly affection and sisterly affection, right? Here's Ananias immediately saying, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you. Okay, but that, that's the, 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 the main point that I want you to see. Ananias says that Jesus appeared to Saul, right? Again, in 2214, he said, this is Paul speaking, the God of our fathers, oh, excuse me, um, uh, this is not Paul speaking, but it's recounting what happened. It says, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Okay, so Paul saw the righteous one. He uh, is said to have seen him and heard him. And as, in, as chapter 9 says, Jesus appeared to him. So you have the objective statement, he appeared to you. And then you have this statement that Paul, for his part, saw the Lord Jesus. He saw that which appeared to him. He saw the righteous one. Okay, In Acts 26, here's Paul's first person account. Uh, get up and stand on your feet. Uh, so Paul is recounting what Jesus said to him. For this purpose, 
I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you. Now, we're not going to look at subsequent appearances to Paul, but there are other occasions when Scripture speaks of Jesus appearing to Paul, which all reinforce this idea that it was a visible encounter that Paul had. Okay? Now, what is the content? Uh, now, well, I, I just read uh, some of these before commenting, but uh, this is Acts 9, I believe. Yeah, that's Acts 9. So here in Acts 9, uh, it says, as he was traveling, Paul's third person account, it ha or it's Luke's third person account, it happened that he was approaching Damascus. So he's going to Damascus in order to get professing Jewish believers in Jesus and, and take them uh, for trial. And uh, on the way, it says, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay. Now, this is significant because, well, if for no other reason, then it shows that Jesus identifies with his people. So much so that when his people are being persecuted, Jesus takes it as though he is being persecuted, right? Those who don't listen to you aren't listening to me. Those who hear you hear me, right? these sorts of things. Similarly, those who persecute you persecute me. This is why Jesus in Matthew 25 can say that those who didn't visit uh, or, or take care of orphans and the hungry and clothe people and visit those in prison and so forth didn't do it unto him. Right. Uh, they weren't visiting him in these situations. They weren't visiting him when he was in prison. Right. It says that people will say to him, uh, when was it that you were in prison and we didn't visit you? And Jesus is going to say, in as much as you didn't do it to the least of these, my brethren, you didn't do it to me. Right. So Jesus identifies with his people. But this is the same thing that the Old Testament tells us about God. Right. In fact, I can think of Old Testament call narratives where this idea is present as well, right? In Exodus chapter 3, when God appeared to Moses, God said to Moses, I have seen from heaven uh, the affliction of my people and have come down now to answer, right, the cries that have come up to me. So what God is saying is he sees the affliction of his people, and this causes him to respond right, to come down from heaven and answer their cries. When you look at a place like Isaiah 63, it states it even more graphically, more similar to what we see in Acts 9. In Acts, or excuse me, Isaiah 63, referring back to the Exodus, God says, or the prophet says, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his mercy, he loved them, carried them all the days of old, and so forth. So notice what it what was said to Moses. I have seen their affliction. I have come down to respond to it. The prophet tells us that God himself was afflicted in their afflictions. Okay, God is so united to his people that he takes an attack on them as an attack on him. This already suggests something significant with respect to the identity of Christ, okay? If the people of God are his people and he is united to them as God is united to his people, according to the Old Testament, what is this but for the New Testament to put Christ in the place of Jehovah, okay? Yahweh, right? What the Old Testament says about Yahweh is here said about Jesus, okay? And then Paul asks who he is, and he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So he underscores this. You are persecuting me when you persecute my body, when you persecute those who are united to me. But notice how Paul addresses Jesus. This is monumental. Okay? There have been whole dissertations written on, on this. How this, well, I'll come to that in a moment, but when Paul has this encounter from heaven, okay, note this, from heaven, 
of a brilliant light that knocks him to the ground, causes the people that are with him to be speechless, strikes him blind, right? And he cries out, who are you, Lord? On the one hand, Paul is identifying him. On the other hand, he's asking for further identification, right? What do I mean by that? Well, it's clear to Paul that the one who's appearing to him is Lord. And I'll explain why this is the case, but this cannot mean for Paul anything other than that the one who's appearing to him is God. Okay, But it's also clear to Paul that the one who's appearing to him is one who is as yet unknown to him. That's why he's saying, who are you, Lord? Okay, Now, why do I say that when Paul calls him Lord, it is clear to Paul's mind that this is a divine person? Precisely because while it was possible in the Old Testament, and Paul makes this distinction very clear in the New Two, uh, but it's while it was possible for a Jew in the Old Testament to use the term Lord for earthly authorities, earthly masters, right? Sarah called Abraham her Lord. Uh, slaves might call their masters lords. In fact, when Paul refers to masters in the New Testament and slaves, the term for masters is kurioi, which is the plural term of the word used here, lords. Okay. But what does Paul, as a good Jew, say when he talks, for example, in Colossians 4 of masters, lords, and servants or slaves? or elsewhere in the household codes of his epistles, right? Where he's talking about how to manage the households, the relationships between husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and slaves, citizens and uh, leaders. What Paul says is he tells slaves to submit to their la uh, masters, their lords, uh, as if they were serving not them ultimately, but the Lord who is in heaven. Okay, and then Paul goes on to say, and masters, you too treat your slaves well because you too have a Lord in heaven. Okay, for Paul as a Jew, there's only one heavenly Lord. There's only one Lord in the all important sense uh, of, uh, you know, who it is that is reigning from heaven above. Okay, angels are never legitimately called Lord uh, or treated. Uh, uh, with worship or anything like that. Paul would never refer to a heavenly figure who has appeared to him in a brilliant light and all the other things that attend this without it carrying for him just this significance. Okay, Every Jew confessed, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's the Lord in heaven, Yahweh. Right? That's why Paul could say in Ephesians 4, there is but one Lord, right? One Lord, one faith, one baptism, and so forth. There's one Lord. Context, by the way, he's talking about Jesus. Okay, elsewhere, 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says there's one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were made. Okay, when Paul says that Jesus is the one Lord through whom all things were made, echoing the Shema, he's using the same expression. Right? It's the same exact Greek expression if you if you compare the Greek versions. Those are the only two times Paul uses the phrase one Lord, and both times they refer to Jesus. Okay? For Paul the Jew, there's only one Lord in heaven. Others might be referred to Lord on earth where there's no possibility of mistaking them for God. When it comes to a heavenly being, there's only one who can properly be identified as Lord. Paul knows that this visitor is no ordinary individual, and he calls him Lord. Okay, Now, so revolutionary was this for Paul that if you, I, I've pointed this out in other places, but, and, and this is what I was talking about when I said there are whole dissertations written on this. Um, but when, it, it, when you look at Paul and the other writers of the New Testament, you begin to become familiar with their style, right? Uh, I think 
you know, some of us will be sensitive to that sort of thing. When, when we're reading, if you're reading somebody often enough, you say, oh, this, this has this guy's fingerprints all over it. Right. So I've told you, I used to play this game with my kids. I used to say, okay, you find any place in the Bible and you read to me a sentence. And I'll tell you if I, I'll, what I'll try to do is tell you the book chapter and verse. But if I can't get uh, the, the chapter and verse, I'll try to get the, the book. And if I can't get the book, I'll at least tell you who the author is. Right. And I'll, I would always tell my kids, you're, you're never going to get me on this. Right. I, I was always, <laughs> you know, uh, crossing my fingers, hoping they never stump me, but they never did. Right. So they what they would do is they would flip open the Bible and they'd read from somewhere. And I tell you, oh, that, I tell them that's Moses. Oh, oh, that's, you know, this this prophet, that prophet, that's this apostle, that apostle. Well, that's because even though God is the author of Scripture, ultimately, he's the one who superintends the writing of Scripture such that what the apostles or other authors write is what he wants them to write. Nevertheless, he's not destroying their faculties. He's not overriding their personalities. He's preventing them from error, guiding them into all truth. And they're writing exactly what uh, he wants, which is also consistent with their own personalities, their vocabulary, and, and so forth, right? So you can see distinctive styles between the apostolic writings. And uh, one example of that is seen here. When other writers of the New Testament use the term Lord, it's clear that they use the term Lord in a divine sense for Jesus, just like Paul does. But they're much freer in their use of that term. And what I mean by that is they are freer in the sense that, let's just take the Father and the Son. You can go to the writings of the other apostles, and you'll see the term Lord being used indiscriminately for Father and Son. Right Now, uh, that, that's perfectly true, right? Both persons are Lord. This is a divine title that comes from the Old Testament. And we know it's being used as a divine title, among other reasons, because sometimes when father or son are being referred to as Lord, it's in the uh, course of citing an Old Testament prophecy or an Old Testament passage, which contains, in the Hebrew, the tetragrammaton, the divine name, Yahweh, translated into Greek as kurios. So when the apostles are referring to the Father or to the Son and calling Father or Son Lord and using an Old Testament text to do so, they're using it in that ultimate sense as the uh, equivalent or cognomen of the divine name. Okay, But the, these other apostles freely use the term Lord for the Father or the Son. When you go to the writings of Paul, okay, it was Paul's characteristic style even though he would not, nobody should misunderstand this, he would not deny that the Father is Lord. Outside, first of all, outside of Old Testament quotations, Paul only ever uses the term Lord for Jesus. He never uses the term for the Father. Okay, Now, there's all sorts of ways that I have to say this so that people don't think that they, you know, they, they can... You know, they, they found an exception to what I'm saying. Understand what I'm saying, first of all. Setting aside Old Testament quotations, right? If you read a statement, for example, that the Lord died and rose again, who's he talking about? Okay, there it doesn't say Father or Son, but it's obvious it's talking about Jesus. It was Jesus who died and rose again, not the Father, right? There are other contexts where it doesn't, it's not clear who Paul's talking about, and so you can't use that to prove that he's calling the Father Lord. Whenever Paul indicates in the context who he's talking about, it's always the Son. And whenever he's explicit about who he's calling Lord, it's always the Son, right? Uh, so he'll say things like, uh, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Or think of Paul's opening salutations, grace and peace to you uh, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here Paul uses two divine titles, one God, the other Lord. 
one to refer to the Father, one to refer to the Son. This is Paul's way of pointing up the deity of both persons while simultaneously distinguishing personally between them. Okay, So this was just Paul's convention. It was his characteristic way of distinguishing between the Father and the Son. If you want a good book on that, by the way, read uh, one of my favorites is B.B. Warfield's book, The Lord of Glory, one of the best books out there on the New Testament witness to Christ. Uh, another book that's very good that specifically focuses on Paul. So Warfield's book looks at the whole range of the New Testament. Uh, but uh, Gordon Fee wrote a book called Pauline Christology. And Gordon Fee points out that, well, it's mostly Warfield that has pointed out that the term Lord outside of Old Testament quotations, whenever it's explicit or can be derived from context, it's always Jesus. Okay, there's no unambiguous reference to the Father as Lord. Now, when we reintroduce Old Testament quotations, okay, it is true that Paul sometimes applies a quotation of the Old Testament that has the word Yahweh in it and applies it to the Father. But here's what's striking. Among the, the many times Paul quotes the Old Testament, there's 45 of those citations. So there's a larger pool of citations. 45 of them include a reference to the divine name. 75% of those quotations that are talking about Yahweh are applied to Jesus. So even when Paul cites the Old Testament where it's talking about Yahweh, more often than not, it's being applied to Jesus, not the Father. So, for example, uh, I mentioned Romans 10, he who confesses that uh, Jesus is Lord, right, shall be saved. It's in that context that Paul quotes the prophet Joel, right? All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In the Hebrew text, it's all who call upon the name, the Shem of Yahweh, will be saved, right? And that, that's true throughout Paul's uh, quotations. They're either referred to the Father or the Son, but almost always Jesus, okay? And why would that be? How is it that Paul goes not only from persecuting those who believe in Jesus, but now proclaiming Jesus, and to be to have been so uh, altered uh, that he not just comes to identify Jesus as Lord, but whenever he thinks of the term Lord, it's always Jesus. It's, it's because it was this experience that emblazoned that on Paul's heart and mind. This experience revolutionized Paul's outlook on everything, right? On the identity of Jesus and all things in the light of him. Paul was for Jesus the Lord, right? So every time Paul used the term, he used it for Jesus. Okay? Now this I find remarkable because you've got people that will deny the deity of Christ. You've got Jehovah's Witnesses who pretend that they're Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, if you ask Paul who is Jehovah, it's Jesus. In fact, if you want to deny that Jesus is Jehovah according to Paul, then you would also have to deny that the Father is Jehovah. Because Paul, like I said, only ever calls Jesus Lord outside of Old Testament quotations. And even in those contexts, it's clear that he's using it as a divine title. And even when he quotes the Old Testament, 75% of those quotations are about Jesus. And so... If the evidence is not good enough to conclude that Jesus is Jehovah, then neither is it good enough to conclude that the Father is Jehovah. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, that's just absurd. Of course the Father's Jehovah. Well, welcome to the end then of your argument. If it's absurd to say the Father is not Jehovah, even though the number of times Jesus is explicitly identified as Jehovah trump the number of times that the Father's called Jehovah, well then... It follows, if you can't call Jesus Jehovah, neither should you be permitted to call the Father Jehovah. Okay, So this was for Paul the all-important, earth-changing situation by which he comes forever after to identify Jesus as Lord. Okay, So Paul understands this as a divine theophany. It's clear from the, the, the rest of Paul's writings, right? The very fact that Paul, a Jew, could so quickly, easily, frequently uh, apply uh, the, the divine name to him, okay? Um, 
So this is Acts 2, I mean, 22, you see the same thing again, where Jesus says, you're persecuting me. Paul says, who are you, Lord? And then uh, uh, Paul says in verse 10, uh, Acts 22 adds this additional point. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up and go into Damascus. So notice right from the get-go, Paul says, who are you, Lord? The Lord says, I'm Jesus. And then Paul says, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, right? Th this is this is what sets Paul on this uh, course of always and forever after identifying Jesus as Lord. You see the same thing in Acts 26, right? We don't need to read those. Uh, I'm going to skip past this. Okay. Now, I want you to notice something very quickly about Ezekiel. Um, we're not going to be able to do as much as I would I want to do when it comes to comparing Paul's encounter and Ezekiel today. I'm going to talk about a bunch of stuff. We're not still not close to done. Stick with me. But I want to at least give you one uh, tantalizing thing here. And actually, we're going to read Ezekiel 1, I believe. I have the slides here for that. Um, but there's something interesting, right? Paul in Acts 26 is told, get up and stand on your feet. Okay? In Ezekiel 2.1, after Ezekiel has a vision of God, it says, then he said to me, son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. Now, here's the Greek. In, in Greek, the statement is identical, right? Stand upon the feet of you, literally, to follow the, the Greek syntax. The, the Greek between these two texts is identical. Now, you might say, well, so what, right? I mean, how common is that, right? That's just a common expression. Stand up on your feet. Well, the fact of the matter is, this is not a very common expression. First of all, it's just awkward. Anybody who knows Greek knows that when you look at this, it, it, it's kind of redundant, right? You, you don't need to say stand up and then upon the feet of you, right? Uh, uh, it's, it's redundant in Greek. But, but the fact is, when you look in all of the Old Testament and the New Testament, I'm actually going to come out for a second here. I want to see your response. Remember when I when I use the the screen share thing, I can't see anything except the slide. That's the only thing I can see. Uh, so I can't see your comments or anything else. But I'm going to ask you a question. It might seem to you that that expression would just be a common expression. Certainly not so significant that you could say there's some definite connection that Luke is drawing or Paul is drawing between his theophanic encounter with Christ and theophanies of the Old Testament, particularly the theophany in the case of Ezekiel. Okay, So here's my question to you. If you had to guess, if you had to guess, how many times do you think in the entire Bible do you think that expression is used, stand, upon, stand up upon the feet of you? I've already told you it's very awkward in Greek very awkward. How many times do you think that expression is used? Yeah, cool. Cool. Musa says Ezekiel one also ties in with uh, Revelation one and four. All right. So breakfast gun, I think, is uh, getting at the point. Um, uh, and the, the, those of you that are saying two, zero says three. Um, but when breakfast gun says once, I think he means one other time, right? Besides acts 26, namely in Ezekiel one or two, two, one, right? It only occurs in the entire Bible twice. You've got this awkward expression. I mean, check the commentators. They're going to tell you it's an awkward expression. It's not very smooth Greek. It doesn't mean that it's not intelligible or anything like that. It's just, it, it, it's not very uh, uh, it, it's just not the sort of thing that uh, would be the most smooth way of expressing the idea in Greek. Now, let me let me broaden the picture here. If we go back to uh, earlier times, 
Koine, the peer, the Koine period and centuries before it and centuries after it. If I were to ask you, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you this. This is probably too much to expect anybody to guess here, but is that expression ever used in any other writing outside of the Bible? Now, here's the interesting thing. The answer is yes, but it's only when people are referring to these texts. <laughs> That's the only time this ever appears in the Bible or outside of the Bible is in reference to these texts. This is the sort of thing that is a tip off that you're, you're supposed to be alert to these things. If, if you're reading these things in the original languages, they don't have chapters and verses, right? You can't say, you know, footnote or, or, uh, uh, you, you don't have a, uh, a cross reference thing in your Bible telling you, look back here. I mean, that's not what they had. They would have been tipped off by the use of unusual words and expressions, uh, a word that's used only once or a phrase that's used only once or a cluster of words that are only used in that cluster elsewhere in, in one place or two places. These are the sorts of things that, that, that people pick up on and you're intended to pick up on. Now, this is just I'm just wetting your appetite here. It, it gets way better than this. But I, I'm just showing you that to say there is something here that correlates Paul's encounter of the risen Christ with the vision of God that Ezekiel has by the Kabar River. Okay. Now let me get this uh, super chat in real quick from Dinah. Um, I love, I love that you take time between uploads. So much rich scripture is given in these sessions and we need time to study them. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you, Dinah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd be on more often, honestly, if I didn't have all sorts of other things also to do. Uh, um, the the prison work, by the way, pray for that. It's it's ramped up. There's a lot more going on now with that. Uh, COVID, as you've known, I've told you before, has had, had restricted a lot of the stuff that I had been able to do directly in the prisons. Uh, but now a lot of those restrictions are falling off, which means increased activity for me on that front. Uh, means I, I, I've got to go around to churches and get mentors, train them uh, to become mentors to prisoners. And also it means an increase, uh, hopefully, of opportunities to preach and teach in the prisons. So there's that sort of stuff going on and, and you know, other stuff. So I'd be on here more if I could. Um, but I also love being in prison with prisoners, right? That's where I, I like to be. Um so let's see, did I miss any other super chats? Um, all right, I don't think so. But uh, all right, so let's go back. Now here, um, I think, um, oh yeah, I have, so I have here a quote. I didn't bother to check or put down a bunch of, quotes from commentators, which I could have easily done. But I, I just want to show you that this isn't Anthony who's off his rocker here. Th this is F.F. Bruce. He is a heavyweight, a towering figure when it comes to uh, biblical scholarship. He's commenting on Acts 26 in his, in his commentary on the Acts of the Apostles. And it's actually a commentary on the Greek text. So he's specifically thinking in, in terms of the Greek text here. But he says, from Ezekiel 2.1, where the words are addressed to Ezekiel, who had fallen to the ground when first he saw visions of God. Their repetition to Paul in similar circumstances suggests that he, too, is now called to a prophetic ministry. So F.F. Bruce calls attention to the fact that this language comes right out of Ezekiel 2. Okay, And as I said, and we'll demonstrate, we'll, probably bring up again next week when I make a more in-depth comparison with Ezekiel and Paul's experience. The, the, the fact that Ezekiel's vision is in the background is so painfully obvious, right? It takes a Unitarian to miss it. It takes an Anthony Buzzard to miss it. It takes a Carlos Xavier to miss it. It takes a Dale Tuggy to miss it, right? These are people who study to misunderstand, right? It's their studied intent not to see the deity of Christ in scripture, right? 
it, it's so painfully obvious, and I'll show you, but uh, I don't want to let you think, because I'm going to talk a bit about Ezekiel, and I don't want you to think that I'm, I'm making much about nothing, right? Next week, we're going to show, I'm going to show more about how solid it is to say that Ezekiel's in the background. Right now, I'm just introducing you to this. But he, here's what I want to do. So uh, this is this is a book. Okay, I, I could make this point all on my own. <laughs> I could make this point all on my own. But it's more fun when you can quote a hostile source. Okay, this is a book written by Alan Segal. Okay, Alan Segal is the professor of religion and Ingeborg Rennert professor of Jewish studies at Barnard College. Okay, he's not a Christian. He's a Jew, right? He's not a believer in Jesus. He's most famous for writing this book, okay, which is actually a great book. It's called Two Powers in Heaven. A lot of you have heard of it. Uh, if you haven't heard of it from me, you've quite possibly heard of it from others. But if you've heard me for any bit of time, you know I've referenced it, right? So this is what he's most known for. This, this book is all about the evidence of a debate in early times between the rabbis and some other group or groups of people concerning the Old Testament text, and in particular, passages that seem to entail that there's more than one divine person. Okay, Now, Alan Segal is great about discussing some of this. Uh, he, he kind of misses something significant, which is that he, he wants to make the debate be between the rabbis and non-Jews, but the evidence of the Talmud shows that this debate, while it may have also included those who were not Jews, also included those who were, right? And this is par for the course because we know prior to the Talmudic period, Jews, this was the common view of Jews. We know this from the Targums, from intertestamental literature, it was all over the place that Jews believed in more than one divine person. What's happening during the Talmudic period is that the post-Christian rabbis are now trying to exclude this, expunge this from their midst, because it's now catering to the proclamation, uh, uh, you know, the, the Christian proclamation of the gospel. Christians are now able to go out and say, hey, you know that person whom we've always talked about as the word? That's Jesus, Right. So Alan Segal, anyways, he's most popular for writing this book, Two Powers in Heaven. Great book. But he also wrote this other book. Look at the title. It's called Paul the Convert, The Apostolate and Apostasy of Saul the Pharisee. Okay, So he's revealing his cards there. <laughs> he, he, he doesn't think that Paul is truly Jewish, right? He, he Jew, Jewish in the sense of the religion. He's an apostate from Judaism. Okay, so you know, tell us what you really think, Alan Segal. But I want you to notice this. This uh, from Alan Segal's book. Look what Alan Segal says. Good old Alan Segal. This is from the beginning, towards the beginning of his book. Uh, he says. The most provocative parallel to Luke's account of Paul's conversion is the commissioning of the prophet Ezekiel, whose call was special in several respects. Ezekiel was granted a vision of a figure shaped like a man, which is called the likeness of the image of the glory of God. When Ezekiel beheld the glory of God, he reported, I fell upon my face and I heard the voice of one that spoke. The Lord then ordered Ezekiel to stand, saying, Stand upon your feet, and I will speak to you. I send you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. According to Luke, Paul also has a revelation of the glory of God. Okay, by the way, uh, at certain points in the narrative of Acts, the encounter of Paul, it uses the term glory, but uh, I should have highlighted that, but it, I, I didn't, but it does. Anyways, well, I'll come back to that at some point in this series. Uh, he says, Paul hears a voice speaking, and it's clearly a revelatory voice.
because Paul reacts as Ezekiel did. He falls to the ground. Luke's Paul then rises, but with a significant modification. He receives the charge to go to foreign lands to proselytize a nation of rebels, Gentiles rather than Jews, as in Ezekiel. Moreover, claims of prophetic appointment were not commonplace in first century Judaism. The Jewish authorities had promulgated the idea that prophecy had ceased. A self-proclaimed prophet would therefore attract powerful enemies in the Jewish community. So he's saying that for the Jews, the, the idea of this sort of thing had long passed. There were no more prophets. Uh, the spirit had been withdrawn. Uh, at best, one might hear a bat kol, which is the, 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 the phrase literally means the daughter of a voice, but it, it means like, it's almost like this faint whisper, right? Like, in other words, there are no prophets today. At best, maybe God uh, will somehow cause a whisper to be heard, uh, but, but not actually raise up particular individuals to occupy the office uh, of a prophet. Uh, so when Paul comes along and he describes this, the best background to it is the calling of Ezekiel. And this would have been understood by Jews, and it would have uh, identified Paul as a prophet and would have irked the Jews, uh, would have created for him powerful enemies in the Jewish community. They believe prophecy had ceased. Paul's now proclaiming that prophecy has been reborn, and he's, he's connecting the rebirth of prophecy with Jesus, right? Uh, it's remarkable. But then he goes on, he says, one of the unique aspects of Ezekiel's prophecy was that he envisioned what he see, what, what seemed to be a human figure, the likeness of a man on God's heavenly conveyance, pulled by heavenly beasts. So he's describing like a heavenly chariot or really a, a throne chariot is how it's ordinarily described. It, it functions as both throne and chariot, which is borne along by uh, these great creatures, right? angelic uh, beings. Uh, I'm using the term, some would object using the term angel, but uh, as long as we understand that there's different orders of, of angelic beings who have different functions and so forth, uh, I think it's entirely permissible. But anyways, it says, by using this direct parallel, Luke implies to his original audience that the glory of God was revealed to Paul. Okay. Um, he goes on, the con connection made by Luke between Paul and the call of Ezekiel can be seen clearly in Paul's own writing. The theological implications of this hypothetical identification are staggering. Is Paul's Christianity rooted in the identification of Jesus with the glory of God, the Hebrew kavod, God's sometimes human appearance in the visions of the Hebrew Bible? Luke provides the first interpretation of Paul's conversion by figuring it in terms of Ezekiel's prophetic commissioning as a conversion, commission, or vocation calling, Paul's movement to Christianity is interpreted as the result of a revelation of the image of God's glory. Okay, so that's what he says at the beginning of his book. He actually discusses this in some greater detail later. I just want to read a little bit more of this um, uh, because it's, I think, uh, again, this is a Jewish guy. Uh, the fact that he sees it, I, I don't think it's hard to see it. Like I said, it, it takes a special kind of hostility to the truth to not see it. Alan Segal is not a believer. He'll find other ways to suppress the significance of this, but he's at least admitting this is what the New Testament is presenting. It's presenting Jesus as a, a, a theophanic person, a divine person. Right, the, the same person who appeared to Ezekiel is appearing to Paul. Okay, Al, Segal says, in the Hebrew Bible, God is sometimes described in human form. Note the, the reference. Exodus 23, 21 mentions an angel who has the form of a man and who carries within him or represents the name of God. A human figure on the divine throne is described. Notice the passages that he connects here. It's described in Ezekiel 1. Daniel 7 and Exodus 24, among other places, and was blended, he means in, in later Judaism, was blended into a consistent picture of a principal mediator figure who, like the angel of the Lord in Exodus 23, embodied, personified, or carried the name of God, Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton. This figure, elaborated on by Jewish tradition, 
would become a central metaphor for Christ in Christianity. Now, I do have to stop here and say, this is not a metaphor for Christ in Christianity. This is Christ, according to Christianity, right? It's not a metaphor. That This is the pre-incarnate Christ who's appearing. He is identified as that figure in a multitude of ways, not just by Paul, but by numerous uh, writers. But just give you an example real quick. 1 Corinthians 10. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says to the Corinthians, he mentions that our forefathers were all under the cloud and in the sea, right? They, they were baptized into Moses when they passed through the sea and were in the cloud and so forth. And he says that they were uh, fed spiritual food and spiritual drink. They, they were nourished by the rock that accompanied them. And he says the rock was Christ. Okay, So Paul says it was Jesus who accompanied the Israelites. Well, when you look at the book of Exodus, who is it that's accompanying the Israelites? If you look at Exodus 13, it talks about the pillar of fire and cloud. It says that God is dwelling in the pillar of fire and cloud. He goes before and behind Israel. He leads them. He goes behind them as their rear guard, right? He, he moves positions, if you will. What's fascinating about some of the accounts, and again, the Hebrew is not always as, as literal, but it, it actually describes, it, it, it's, it mentions, like when it talks about the pillar moving, it, it, it describes it as somebody stepping or walking, right? So it's the, the way it's being described is that there's a figure in the midst of the fire and the cloud, okay? A, a person who has an appearance, okay? So a condescension of God, a, a, a figure. Um, and uh, But Exodus 13 says it was God. If you look at Exodus 14, 19, it says it was the angel of the Lord, who is everywhere in the Old Testament, identified as a divine person okay uh so paul says the rock was christ the rock who accompanied them it later says in first corinthians 10 that the people rebelled and god sent fiery serpents among them actually it says they put christ to the test and he destroyed uh many of them so paul thinks of christ as uh you know on center stage in the old testament christ was present and active in the old testament and uh so anyways, uh, Segal is saying that in later, or not later, but in uh, Judaism, uh, eventually, and here he's primarily thinking of like the early centuries uh, after Christ, um, e even before. I mean, there, there's stuff in Second Temple literature where Jews are discussing these things. Uh, but he says that they, they, they recognized the parody of these things, parity, not parody, right? P-A-R-I-T-Y parody that these these things uh comport with each other go together and so they, they they saw these as contributing to an overall picture of this exalted figure okay he said he goes on the preeminence of the enigmatic human figure is due primarily to the description of the angel of the lord in exodus so he's saying this is a text from which a lot of this takes its cue okay this this mysterious figure mysterious to them right <laughs> mysterious to people that think paul's an apostate uh, but uh, he goes on, he says, uh, uh, it states, behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way. Now, I should stop real quick and point out the word angel in Hebrew is just the word melach. It means messenger, and it doesn't identify the kind of being that's in view. That's how we use the term in Hebrew and Greek. The word angel messenger is used for men as well as heavenly beings, and it's even used for God. It just refers to somebody who comes and speaks. Okay, So it has no ontological import by itself. All we know is that it's some figure who's uh, carrying out some kind of task. Right? It says here, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place which I have prepared. Give heed to him, that is this one, the one that he's sending, and hearken to his voice, by the way, that's a uh, technical phrase in in its its uh, covenantal language, right? You're uh, throughout the Old Testament, it's it's God's voice that you're to listen to. Here, God says, "Give heed to Him and hearken to His voice. Listen to Him." Literally in the text, uh, do not rebel against Him. For this is, listen to this, He will not pardon your transgression. For My name is in Him. No, note the connection there. He's going to go before them. They are supposed to listen to him, language used for God, 
it's his voice there to listen to. They're not to listen to the voice of strangers. Do not rebel against him. So you're to submit to this one. And then here's the explanation. Here's why you're not to rebel against him. He has the authority to hold your sins against you and not pardon your sins. Who is it that could that possibly has the prerogative over divine forgiveness but a divine person? Okay. By the way, this expression, he will not pardon your transgression, is only used one other time in the Bible, which is in Joshua 24, where Joshua uses it for God. He says, you can't serve the Lord. He's a holy God. He will not pardon your transgression. Right. So this expression used for the angel of the Lord is only elsewhere used for God. It indicates divine prerogative, the prerogative to retain or withhold forgiveness. Elsewhere, we see the angel of the Lord exercising the prerogative for forgiveness. In Zechariah 3, he uh, says to Zechariah, who's standing before him and being accused by Satan, by the way, the angel of the Lord is sitting on the divine throne in Zechariah 3, seated on the th seated on the throne, standing before him is Joshua the high priest, and at his side to accuse him is Satan. And the angel of the Lord rebukes Satan, and then pronounces Joshua's sins forgiven. He says, see, I have removed your iniquity from you. Okay, so the angel of the Lord has the prerogative to forgive sin. So you're to listen to his voice and not rebel him against him. This is why, because he has power of forgiveness, to forgive or not, and he won't forgive your part, your transgression, right? And then why is that? Why does he have this authority? Because my name is in him, okay? You can't dismiss this language as merely uh, he's a representative of God or something like that. That's just not how this language is used in Scripture. God's name stands for God himself. right? That's why sometimes Scripture will say things like, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. right? Those who run into it will be saved. Notice how it puts the name of God for God himself. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. It, literally, the Lord is a strong tower. Uh, the name represents God himself. Sometimes when scripture speaks of God dwelling in the temple, instead of saying God dwells in the temple, it says God will place his name there. So the, the name of God indicates the presence of God. That's where God is. So this name-bearing individual who within himself bears the very name of God and on that basis has the prerogative to forgive sins, and for which reason he is to be absolutely obeyed and not rebelled against, right, is clearly a divine person. Oh, but it gets, it, it gets better. But let me go on reading Seagal. He says, the Bible expresses, it should have been a capital T, the Bible expresses the unique status of this angel by means of its participation in the divine name. In Exodus 33, 18 through 23, Moses asked to see the glory of God. Okay, now remember, this is significant. Paul sees the glory. Ezekiel sees the glory. I'll, I'll uh, use these this term. And Moses asked to see God's glory. Okay? In answer, God makes his goodness pass in front of him, but he cautions, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. By the way, I have to stop here for a second because there's a paradox in Exodus 33. Obviously, the angel of the Lord is seen. So you might say, well, this can't be talking about the angel of the Lord, but that doesn't follow. In Exodus 33.10, it says Moses spoke with God face to face. But then Moses says, show me your glory. And God says, it's, you can't see me and live. What's going on here is not that Moses hasn't seen God, but that Moses is asking for a further revelation of him. Because in the nature of the cases, I've already said, this vision of God involves a condescension. It's impossible for a finite creature to uh, fully take in the infinite. So God has humbled himself to appear to people, and Moses knows there's more. There's more going on here. He wants to see more, and God says that's not possible, right? So, But he says in answer, uh, it, it, God makes his goodness pass in front of him, but cautions, you can't see my face, for no man, for, for man shall not see me and live. Behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand upon the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Now, he doesn't quote this, Seagull, but in the narrative, the revelation of God accompanied by the receding glory 
is a revelation that's also audible. So God passes by Moses declaring his name. So this revelation of the receding glory of God in answer to Moses' request to see God's glory, right, is bound up with it, this declaration of the divine name, right? That name, which is born by the angel of the Lord. Anyways, Sagol goes on, Yahweh himself, the angel of God and his glory are peculiarly melded together, suggesting a deep secret about the ways God manifested himself to humanity. <laughs> you gotta love that. A deep secret. <laughs> no, Sagol, the secret's out. <laughs> we know who that was. <laughs> We know who that was. But but here's Seagal. He at least recognizes, though he doesn't believe, that what's going on in these New Testament descriptions of Christ's appearance is clearly something that is picking up on and involves, as, as ways of talking about it, these Old Testament theophanies, especially the one that occurred to Ezekiel, which itself is similar to, in certain ways, other theophanic appearances, right? Uh, now, here's Ezekiel 1. we got to read the whole thing. You, you, you've got to get the impact of this. okay? Because, again, remember, Paul's being very terse in Galatians 1. We have a fuller description of his encounter in Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. I'm repeating it because that's going to stick in your minds. Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. Paul is tersely referring to this. But once you realize what he's referring to, it, it it should have all the more impact on you, the significance of what it means then for Paul to say his gospel is not from man. He neither received it from man, nor was he taught it, but received it as a revelation from Jesus Christ. This Christ is the, the, the Lord, the, the likeness of the glory of God that appeared to Ezekiel who appeared to Moses, who appeared to Isaiah, who appeared to Jeremiah. That's the one whose authority stands behind this gospel. Okay. Now, listen to this description. Now, the interesting thing is um, Ezekiel spends more time talking about the attendants of God, right, the, the creatures that attend him, and, and it's almost like he's reticent to talk about God himself. He eventually does, but even then he, he wants to, uh, and again, you like, you look at the commentators and it's like, it's like Ezekiel's bending over backwards to say, uh, you know, to, to like very carefully, uh, fence what he's saying because, you know, it was such an awesome sight uh, it's like Ezekiel doesn't want to, uh, he, he's not, he can't bring himself to, uh, speak as directly as he might have, of, you know, seeing somebody else. Anyways, we'll, we'll get to that. Chapter one, it says it came about in the 13th year on the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was by the river Kabar among the exiles. The heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Okay, so note that expression. I saw visions of God. Okay. On the fifth of the month, in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's exile, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of uh, Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar, and there the hand of the Lord came upon him. As I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually and a bright light around it. Sound familiar? Flashing light, flashing around and so forth. And in its midst, something like a glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Within it, there were figures resembling four living beings. And this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet were like a calf's hoof and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides were human hands. As for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. 
As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right and the face of a bull on the left. And all four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching another being and two covering their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go without turning as they went. In the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. By the way, note that he's, I, I said that this uh, picture is of a, uh, you might refer to it as a chariot or a throne or simply as a throne chariot. It functions as both. Okay. And that's how it's described elsewhere. That's how it's understood in the literature. Uh, and it, it, it's significant then that when, where, where else have you heard of, uh, burning coals of fire is somehow related to God's presence. Well, think of the calling of Isaiah. Remember when Isaiah sees the Lord, uh, one of the angels uh, grabs a coal from the, the altar and, and touches his lips with it, right? So here, similarly, you have uh, in the midst of this vision, uh, the living beings, uh, in the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. Uh, the fire was bright and lightning was flashing from the fire and the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. Now, as I looked at the living beings, behold, there was one wheel on the earth beside the living beings for each of the four of them. The appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling barrel and all four of them had the same form. Their appearance and workmanship being as if one wheel were within another. Whenever they moved, they moved in any of their four directions without turning as they moved. As for their rims, they were lofty and awesome, and the rims of all four of them were full of eyes round about. Whenever the living beings moved, the wheels moved with them. And whenever the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose also. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction. And the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Whenever these went, uh, those went, these went, and whenever... <laughs> Those stood still. I'm going to tell you why I'm laughing in a second. Uh, these stood still. And whenever those rose from the earth, the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Okay, now before I go on, uh, let me let me first tell you why I'm laughing. <laughs> no, it's, it's obvious that the description here, like I said, is of like a throne chariot. Uh, you have this conveyance that uh, is... is somehow associated with these living creatures and their movement. Uh, so they're, they're at its sides and so forth and their movement and its movements are coordinated, all this stuff, right? Heavenly conveyance. We're going to read in a minute about the figure who's occupying this conveyance. But it, 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 this is funny to me because years ago I was listening to Farrakhan, <laughs> old Calypso Louis, right? Lips, uh, Louis Farrakhan. <laughs> He is the uh, successor of uh, Elijah Muhammad and Wallace Farr, the leader of the Nation of Islam. And, man, he's wild, right? So <laughs> there are a lot of these cult leaders that I think, man, how is it that anybody listens to these guys? Because I don't find most of them very entertaining. I, I find some of them boring as all get out. But when I watch somebody like Farrakhan, even though he's loopy and nuts, I think this guy's at least entertaining, if nothing else, right? So one time, Farrakhan, they've got just this crazy theology, right? Uh, for them, the gods are, are finite beings, and uh, one of them's an evil scientist god who uh, made the white man, and there's all this crazy stuff. But uh, that lends itself to this whole idea of, the gods is more like aliens than, you know, beings that occupy time and space and are constrained by it, bound by it, limited by it, right? And and so have definite limitations than a transcendent being who actually made it, you know, upholds it, governs it. So when uh, Farrakhan was talking at one time, he said, he says that uh, there's this mothership out there, right? <laughs> and he says, uh, he's like, you know, uh, most important figure. And they're always keeping their eye on him, right? And uh, speaking of the mothership, I could still hear the words ringing in my ears. He says, it follows me everywhere I go. <laughs> Tell me that wasn't a good Farrakhan impression. 
But he, so he says this mothership follows him wherever he goes, right? And <laughs> but but he says he says that this uh, the description in Ezekiel is is not uh, again like I said it's a, it's a description of a throne being conveyed by these angelic creatures, but he says it's a spaceship. So when it speaks about eyes being all around the wheels and so forth. What, what it is, is you're supposed to think of a spaceship with windows, and there are people looking out the windows. <laughs> so, I don't know, the mothership's out there, folks. The mothership's out there. It's following Farrakhan. Um, <laughs> hilarious, isn't it? So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Matthew. Matthew says, God bless you. Thank you for all that you share. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um and yeah, so uh, let's get back to these. So, so there's the description in Ezekiel of his vision. He he's well, the description at least of the the creatures and this mode of transport, right? That they're associated with. Now we have now we read what it goes on to say. Like I said, the what we've just read seemed long. It gives much more time to talking about the description of this conveyance and these angelic creatures. It's going to be much briefer relatively, relative to the other description, when it talks about the figure on it. And you're going to see how reserved he is in, in talking about the figure. Um, but uh, hold on, let me share here. All right. So carrying on, it says, Now over the heads of the living beings, there was something like an expanse. Don't miss this. Like the awesome gleam of crystal spread out over their heads. Uh, under the expanse, I, I'm just stopping because I'm trying to think of the underlying Hebrew there kind of curious to me the way it put it but anyways under the expanse their wings were stretched out straight one toward the other each one also had two wings covering its body on the one side and on the other i also heard the sound of their wings like the sound of abundant waters as they went like the voice of the almighty a sound of tumult like the sound of an army camp whenever they stood still they dropped their wings and there came a boy a voice from above the expanse that was over their heads whenever they stood still they dropped their wings now, above the expanse that was over their heads, there was something resembling a throne. There's the explicit language calling this a throne, like lapis lazuli in appearance. And on that which resembled a throne, notice he doesn't even speak of the throne directly. He speaks of the resemblance of a throne, right? And the appearance of this and the likeness of that, right? On that which resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. Then I, num uh, uh, then I noticed from the appearance of his loins and upwards something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around within it. Sounds like the description of the Son of Man in Revelation 1, right? And from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like fire, and there was a radiance around him. And the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the astounding or the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a voice speaking. Now, I, I want to remind you real quickly so, so that you're not misunderstanding that this is actually an appearance of God to Ezekiel. Okay, Ezekiel is using very guarded language here because it's a precarious thing to describe God. And, and so uh, that's, you know, that's what Ezekiel is doing he's he's being very restrained but notice the the verse the the chapter begins by saying the heavens were opened and he saw visions of god okay that's ezekiel 1 1 but notice that it says in 126 above the expanse that was over their heads there was something resembling a throne so it's talking about a throne um and uh here's ezekiel 9 which ties in with this in ezekiel 9 it says then the glory of the god of israel Notice he drops the likeness language. Then the glory of the God of Israel went up from the cherub on which it had been to the threshold of the temple, and he called to the man clothed in linen at whose loins was the writing case. The Lord said to him, 
right? So it's it's the one who goes up from the cherubim, right? Who's who calls to the man, and he's explicitly said to be the Lord in verse four, right? Obviously, same figure that Ezekiel describes in Ezekiel one. But here it's uh, oh, actually, well, I'm going to skip over this. I'll I'll bring this up another time. Uh, but here is Ezekiel ten. Um, uh, then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. When the cherubim departed, they lifted their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight with the wheels beside them. And they stood still at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the God of Israel hovered over them. These are the living beings that I saw beneath the God of Israel by the river Kabar. Okay, so there it's quite explicit. Ezekiel saying that this one who is over the cherubim on the throne and beneath which are the cherubim are, is the same figure that he saw and re recounted seeing back in Ezekiel one. And he explicitly calls him the God of Israel. Okay. So there can be no question. And I, I, I could multiply examples here. There can be no question that the figure that Ezekiel sees is God himself. Now, Start putting some of this together, though. You have this running thing throughout the Old Testament. Prophets are directly called by God. These direct callings are typically audible and uh, often enough involve some sort of visible manifestation. Okay. And even apart from call narratives, you have theophanies, right? In Genesis 18, it's not a call narrative, but God appears to Abraham. God appeared to Hagar in Genesis 16. It wasn't a call narrative. But you do have, so you have theophanies in general. You have these call narratives in particular where God often appears. He's visible to people. And that uh, appearance involves God taking the form of a man. Closely associated with this, often, in many of these texts, the name of this figure is the angel of the Lord, the Melach Yahweh, the one who has the prerogative to forgive sins, the one who must be obeyed absolutely, the one who bears the very name of God, Exodus 23, right? In fact, I have to show you this to sort of tighten things up a bit here. Um It is 24. So sharing my screen. I'm narrating my actions here, so you don't think I'm just <laughs> lost for words. Um, so here is Exodus 24. Okay. Remember, Alan Segal is the one who suggested a connection between Exodus 24 and Ezekiel 1 and Daniel 7. No, notice what it says. 24.1 says, He said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Make that bigger for you. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Okay, so you've got three groups here, right? You've got the people who can't go up. Then you've got uh, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel who can come up, but they can't go all the way with Moses. Right? Moses alone is allowed to get all the way up close and personal with God. Okay. Notice as we go down here the description of what, what they see. Verse 9 says, Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. How much plainer can it get, my Jewish friend? They saw the God of Israel. Yes, God can make himself uh, known. He can reveal himself in outward ways, visible ways, palpable ways to the senses. Right? They saw the God of Israel. But notice, under his feet there appeared a to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. That's the same thing we just read in Ezekiel when it was describing the throne vision. 
right? The, the cherubim beneath the Lord and then the Lord being enthroned above them on this conveyance. The, uh, the Israel, or excuse me, Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel are seeing this, right? They're seeing the same thing Ezekiel saw, okay? Now, Segal has already pointed out, some of you may not have connected some of the dots here, and I don't even think Segal perfectly connects them himself, uh, but uh, in Ezekiel, there, there's this explicit mention that, that he has the appearance of a man, right? There's this figure described as the glory of the Lord, the God of Israel, on this heavenly conveyance, and he's described as having the appearance of a man. What's also true in other theophanic encounters, and in particular, appearances of the angel of the Lord. If you go back to Exodus 24, 1, there's something very curious about how it begins. Not just according to me, I'm going to show you in a minute, this caused those post-Christian rabbis some trouble too. <laughs> well, it doesn't cause me any trouble, but... <laughs> When it says here, he said to Moses, who said, right? Who, who's talking here? Who is it that says to Moses, come up to the Lord? Okay. Well, obviously it's the Lord who's talking. Now, if you go back in, in the context, you'll, you'll see that even more clearly. I'm, I'm going to go back in the context in a second, but I think it's evident right here who's talking. Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall not uh, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Now, the 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 reason this is problematic potentially is because if it's the Lord who's speaking, then who's he talking about? Right? He said to Moses, "Come up to the Lord." Why doesn't he say to Moses, "Come up to me"? Right. And why does verse two go on to say Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near. Why doesn't he say shall come near to me? Right. It's God who's talking. Why is he talking about the Lord as though it's someone other than himself? OK, now it's possible for one person to refer to himself in the third person. That's I freely grant that. And that's, that happens sometimes. But it often happens in Scripture so frequently in reference to God that you have to wonder, why does he do that so often? But more than that, it happens in contexts that already account for why you'd have this third-person reference. You already have an explanation contextually why God is speaking about the Lord as though it's someone other than him. Right now, but let me show you something in the Talmud. Okay, this is uh, Anhedrin 38b, and this is actually a section of the Talmud where it deals with a bunch of two powers verses. Um, and I'm not going to read all these. I just show you a little flavor of this. Um, hold on, let me try and get rid of that. Um. All right. Um, all right. Let's go down here. So Rabbi Yohanan says, any place in the Bible from where the heretics attempt to prove their heresy, that is, that there's more than one God, the response to their claim is alongside them, that is, in the immediate vicinity of the verses they cite. Okay, so... Obviously, Christians don't believe in more than one God, but those who oppose our doctrine often miscast it because they know they can't refute the position if accurately represented, so they resort to misrepresentation. Okay, that's classic. That's that's just you know, that's on the first page of every anti-Trinitarian's playbook. Okay, but it's it's talking about there's these heretics, these people who are deviating from orthodoxy. Right. And, and we're dealing with these dastardly people that assert that there's a plurality of divinity. One of the verses that they quote is Genesis 126. Let us make man in our image, employing the plural. But it, uh, but, but it then states, and God created man in his image, employing the singular. 
So what the rabbi is saying is if they bring up a verse speaking of God in the plural, then you bring up a verse uh, right after it, it, usually right after it, there'll be a verse that speaks in the singular. Now I have to tell you, and a Jew is going to point this out for us in a moment, that doesn't deal with the issue, right? You don't deal with the claim that God is both one and many, one God and three persons, by trying to pit passages that talk about God's unity against passages that talk against his diversity. See, the Christian view is that it's all true. God is one God in three persons, and, and therefore it is appropriate to refer to him in the plural and the singular, right? So you don't refute one, what one passage says by saying, hey, this other passage says this. You've got to show how these passages harmonize. So that's not really an answer. But it goes on. It says the verse, uh, the, um, the verse states, God said, come, let us go down and there confound their language. So it's quoting Genesis 11, 7. But it also states in the same context, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. Okay. And then again, the verse states in the plural, their God was revealed to him. Niglu means literally they revealed themselves to him when he fled from the face of his brother. But it also states in the singular to God who answers me in the day of my distress. Okay. So again, all they're doing is they're saying, okay, yeah, there are these passages that speak of God in the plural, and we can dismiss them by pointing to passages that speak of God in the singular. Well, why not just excise them from your Bible if they're, you know, why couldn't a uh, a person who disagrees with Israel's, uh, these post-Christian Talmudic Jews, with their view, why can't they just say, every verse that speaks of God in the singular, close at hand is a verse that speaks of God in the plural, so we can dismiss these singular references, right? We could play the same game, uh, turnabout's fair play. Okay, now I said, uh, I said shortly, a, a Jew's going to point this out, and it's actually not here in the Talmud, but uh, elsewhere, where this explanation is given, and then what happens is the heretics depart, the so-called heretics depart, and then the disciples of the rabbi further question the rabbi and say, you have dismissed them with a mere makeshift. How will you answer us? And that's where it's left. Okay? In other words, you've, you've uh, effectively uh, hoodwinked these guys. They fell for that, but we know better. How are you going to refute? I mean, how are you going to answer us? Tell us how the explanation goes, right? And then it just drops there. It doesn't go on to give an explanation. So it's kind of funny when you read uh, the sources dealing with this. Okay, but I'm gonna I'm gonna move on here. I just I will note that in Sanhedrin 38b that it also makes reference to Deuteronomy 4 verse 7, um, uh, because in Deuteronomy 4 7 there's another plural in reference to God. Um, 2 Samuel 7:23. Uh, it has another plural. The English doesn't show the plural, um, but it, it, it is in the Hebrew, right? Um, the word went, oh, they say it right here. The term went is written in plural, halachu, uh, but the term himself is written in singular. And so it uses uh, both singular and plural, right? And then it mentions Daniel 7, 9, where it says, till thrones were placed and one that was ancient of days did sit. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got all these texts, classic Christian proof texts. I use these all the time, debating uh, heretics. Okay, but why am I bringing all this up? Well, because if we go down here, oh, it's still talking about Daniel 7. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Okay, here it is. Rav Nachman says, this one, that is any person, who knows how to respond to the heretics as effectively as Rav Edit should respond to them. But if he does not know, he should not respond to them. In other words, don't answer heretics if you don't know how to do it. Just, just be quiet, right? The Gemara relates, a certain heretic said to Rav Edit, it is written in the verse concerning God, and to Moses he said, come up to the Lord. The heretic raised a question. It should have stated, come up to me. Rav Edith said to him, this term, the Lord, in that verse is referring to the angel Metatron, whose name is like the name of his master, as it is written, behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Take heed of him and obey his voice. Do not defy him. 
for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. <laughs> All right, so um, th this is great stuff, right? <laughs> um, I want you to notice something, first of all. Before dealing with how he tries to deal with this. First of all, notice this. Notice what the rabbi does not say. The rabbi does not deny. Yeah, a synagogue says it sounds like a Hasbro toy. <laughs> Metatron, but it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Metatron sounds like Megatron. Oops. So um, notice what the rabbi doesn't do. And this is put down in the Talmud as a definitive explanation. The rabbi does not say, oh, God is just speaking in the third person. Okay, That's not how he understands the language. He understands that there's a definite distinction here between the Lord and the one he's talking about. Okay, So the Lord is telling Moses, Nadab, Aaron, Abihu, 70 of the elders of Israel to come up. Right, And the 70 elders and the three others that accompanied them and Moses are going to see the God of Israel. The God of Israel. The same description given of him that's given in Ezekiel 1. The rabbi admits this is not the figure who's speaking to Moses. Okay, That's point number one. And by the way, there's a, a, another Jewish scholar named Daniel Boyarin who wrote a series of essays in the Harvard Theological Review. Some of them eventually found their way into uh, a book that he wrote called Borderlines, the partition between Judaism and Christianity, or the, the parting of the ways, or something, something along those lines. Um, but he's got a number of great articles. He's got the Gospel of the Memra in there, which isn't uh, so much about the New Testament as about its Old Testament background and Judaistic background. Uh, he's got something on the Son of Man. Actually, that might not appear in his book, Borderlines, but just in one of his Harvard Review articles. Um, but he's got this excellent section where he deals with this portion of the Talmud. And it's, it's, it's funny because he rips Rav Edi to shreds, right? This guy's an Orthodox Jew, and he points out how inadequate this response is, okay? But what I, I want you to observe first is that uh, the rabbi doesn't try to say, oh, this is just God's talking about himself, you know, in the third person. He takes as undeniable that the language indicates a distinction. One person is talking about another, and the person who's talking... Who's not, I mean, the, the one that he's talking about is the one that appears to Moses and the 70 elders. And it's the same one who appears to Ezekiel. Okay, Which means that if the connection is right between Ezekiel and Paul, then the connection of the figure seen by Ezekiel and Jesus is also at once establishing the connection between the one who appeared to Moses and the 70 elders with the one who appeared to Paul, the Lord Jesus. Right. And, and we can keep this sort of connection game up for days. I could show the connection all across the Hebrew Bible between these these figures and these theophanic, uh, the figure, the one figure in these theophanic encounters. But the second point to note is that Rav Edi explains the distinction in terms of the prior chapter. And he's right. He's dead on. That's exactly the explanation. Okay, When God said to Moses, come up the mountain to the Lord, the one that he's talking about is the one he just got through talking about. He just got through talking to Moses about this person who's going to go before them who bears the very name of God, who has the prerogative to forgive sins. Right? That one. And the, the, the mistake, though, or the problem of Rav Edi is pretending that he can dismiss this as simply a lesser being whose name is like that of his master. Okay, now, 
here's the problem. Okay, Here, here's what they're trying to do. They're, they're playing off of their reference. So the, the word uh, Metatron, uh, in various ways, Jews have, have said that this name is similar to God's name, right? Um, some, some speculations about the derivation of the name is Meta, uh, which means uh, above or uh, with, and then uh, Tron, uh, Thronos, right? So with the throne, above the throne, whatever. And so uh, by different means, they try to connect this name with some name for God and say they sound similar, right? The problem is this, number one. It, it doesn't say that this one bears a name similar to God's. My name is in him, right? Secondly, Exodus 24 doesn't say, come up to the, mount, uh, the mountain to the one whose name is like the Lord's. It says, come up the mountain to Yahweh. Come up the mountain to Yahweh. If you look at the Talmud, when it treats the divine name, okay, it has two expressions, among others, that it uses for it. One is the Shem Ha Maforesh, and the other is the Shem Ha Yahud, which means, uh, uh, respectively, the the unique name and uh, uh, the distinctive name, right? Uh, and and the idea is that this name belongs to God alone. Okay, it's it's His name. You bought, while other terms might be used loosely for other beings. Right, like you might even use the term God in some contexts, not to indicate that these are actually transcendent over created reality, but beings of great power within reality, uh, or earthly judges. Right, the term God can sometimes be used in a loose sense, and context always, you know, makes it clear we're not talking about deity in the absolute sense. Just like, you know, I might say that person's God is their stomach, or Paul said that, right? Uh, or uh, Satan is the God of this age, as some people would understand, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Um, but the term Yahweh, the tetragrammaton, Jehovah, is viewed as God's incommunicable name, the distinctive name, the unique name, okay? the name that belongs to God alone. So the Talmud recognizes this is God's name. That name will never be given to a creature. Okay, that's Jewish understanding. That's Orthodox Christian understanding. It always has been. Uh, you could pick up one or, uh, Christian theology book off the shelf after another, and you'll see that they all treat the divine name Yahweh as God's covenant name that belongs to Him alone. It can't be used for creatures. Okay, that was believed by the Jews long before Christians believed it, and it's based on a whole slew of texts in the Bible. I'm not going to go over them all right now. But I want you to note here the, 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 the problem this creates for the Jews. Here you have the divine name being applied to this figure. Okay. And then you get this little weasel, uh, you know, word or weaseling expression as a way of trying to get around this. It doesn't say that he has a name like the name of his master. It calls him Jehovah. Right. I know I keep going back and forth between Yahweh and Jehovah. That's just because I'm, I'm kind of used to the older ecclesiastical way of, of pronouncing the divine name. You read older literature, they usually use Jehovah. It's more common in contemporary scholarship to use Yahweh. Uh, but anyways, um, the divine name is, is incommunicable according to uh, the Bible, according to ancient Judaism, according to historic Christianity. It's a name that belongs to God and no one else. So here we have this figure known as the angel of the Lord, who appears as in the form of a man, frequently, repeatedly. In fact, he's he occupies center stage throughout the Torah, right? Who was it that appeared to Hagar? The angel of the Lord. Who has appeared to Abraham in Genesis 18 and Genesis 22? The angel of the Lord. Who was it that spoke to Isaac in Genesis 26? The angel of the Lord. Who appeared to Jacob in, in chapter 28, in chapter 31, in chapter 32, in chapter 35? I mean, all over the place. The angel of the Lord, right? Uh, who is it that goes before and behind Israel in pillar of fire and cloud? The angel of the Lord, which means that when Moses meets with God at the tent of meeting and the pillar of fire and cloud comes to rest there, who's he meeting with? The angel of the Lord. When uh, the, the divine glory occupies the temple, who is it? 
uh, it's the angel of the Lord, right? That divine person who is uh, somehow distinct from the Lord, but also identified as the Lord. Okay, this is the same figure that appeared to Moses atop Sinai. In fact, when you think about it, think about it this way. Uh, well, just I'm just adding a little interesting tidbit here. If you look at the experience of Moses, it's almost like you you do get this sort of escalating theophany, right? When God first appeared to Moses at the burning bush, he appeared at, uh, in the midst of the fire, right? The bush is on fire, but it's not consumed. So that in itself was an awesome sight. This this bush that's blazing with fire, right? It's not this little, you know, it's not, not like a a match or something. This this bush is is like an inferno. It's blazing, right? But it's not being consumed. But then, as as the story progresses and Israel's being taken out of Egypt, now suddenly God appears in a pillar of fire and cloud that's visible to the whole nation. So now we've got this escalation of the theophany. But then when they get to Mount Sinai, it goes off the rails, right? Now, when you get to Sinai, if you read the descriptions from Exodus 19 to Exodus 24, the description that's given is of the mountain being all ablaze, right? So now it's it's this mountain that's ablaze, and in the midst of the fire is God. And... Uh, I mean, just the awesome sight. And by the way, it's often missed, but Exodus 19 and 20 tell us that the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down the mountain were thundered, right? God literally spoke in the hearing of all Israel the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments. They're, they're called the Ten Words in, in Hebrew. God spoke the Ten Commandments to Israel. They heard him. Right. It was this great and awesome experience. Now catch this. It was this great and awesome experience. Remember when Moses talks about another prophet coming in the future. And he says, there's going to be a prophet that the Lord your God will raise up for you like me. OK, what what is what does Moses say to the people of Israel? He says you're to listen to him. OK. Same expression used for the angel of the Lord, right? God says to the to Moses that the Israelites and Moses included, they're to listen to him, okay? The, the angel of the Lord. Moses tells the people in Deuteronomy 18, when he's about to die, in the future, God's going to send you another prophet like me, okay? There'll be other prophets in between, but there's somebody coming who will, in some special manner, be like me. You're to listen to him, okay? uses this same pregnant terminology. But it connects this to Sinai. It, he connects this to Sinai, right? Moses says, This is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly. Horeb's another name for Sinai. When God spoke to the people from the mountain, from the midst of the fire, amidst the flashing of light and the rumblings and the earthquakes, the people cried out and said, don't speak to us this way anymore, right? Talk to Moses. Moses will talk to us, but we can't bear this awesome sight. So we want you to, to tone it down is kind of what they're saying. <laughs> Cut us some slack here, right? And so Moses says, there's going to come a prophet in the future. You're going to listen to him, right? And this is according to what you asked at the day of Horeb. Why? Because they couldn't bear the sight of God. So uh, they, they need a go-between. This reminds me, I mean, what's going on here is, is just this. This is, there's a series of things that happen in Israel's history where they, where certain things bring about the need for a particular office, or at least they think that there's this need, especially in the case of prophet and king. Um, remember when Israel gets a king, they're looking around at the other nations and they say, oh, we want a king like the other nations. And then Samuel's upset because Samuel's the prophet. He was their mouthpiece. Uh, God spoke through him. So he takes it personal. And then God says, don't, don't fret, Samuel. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me as their king. Right. So when Israel wanted a king, they're saying this arrangement is not adequate. We want a human king. Well, 
this is contrary to the divine desire in the sense that God wants to be the, the, the king of his people. And yet God condescends to their weakness. And he says, okay, you can have a king. Now, how's God, is he going to leave it this way? Is he going to, how's he going to resolve this? His ultimate desire is to be the king of his people. No, no go between, but to be his, the king of his people. He allows them to have a human king. How's he going to rectify this? By becoming a man, right? The king, the true king is going to become a man. He's going to be a descendant of David, right? Well, you have something similar going on in the case of prophethood. The people of Israel cannot bear the sight and sound of God. And so they cry out for a man to be a go-between. That's not ultimately what God desires. What he ultimately desires is to be uh, uh, in fellowship directly with his people. So the way he's going to resolve this ultimately is by coming in the flesh. And that's what Moses is ultimately predicting. He's predicting that the one who spoke from Sinai is going to be the one. And uh, I didn't intend to talk too much about Deuteronomy 18, so I'm not going to give more detail on this, but there's a lot more. But what at least I'm putting in your head here is this idea that there's a connection between Sinai and Deuteronomy 18, identifying the, the, the expected one that would be like Moses as, in fact, the angel of the Lord. Well, anyways, at, at, uh, to tie this back in with Paul, what we have then is a clear distinction in the Old Testament of divine persons. There's more than one person, according to the Old Testament itself, who is Yahweh, who's properly denominated by the incommunicable name of God, okay, and therefore who is to be obeyed, has the prerogative to forgive sins, and so forth. Uh, that figure is the one who appeared to, to Moses and the 70 elders and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, who spoke in the hearing of all Israel. That figure is the same one who appeared to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 1 and again in Ezekiel 10. And next week, I'll talk more about the connection of these things to Daniel 7 and then uh, get into more depth in, in terms of the, the relationship between Paul's theophanic encounter and Ezekiel. Because uh, remember, as I said, there's there's a lot more that shows the connection there. But but what is what does this all bring us to? I mean, what is the what is the point that Paul is driving at? Okay. Let's go back to the verses in Galatians 1. In Galatians 1. Paul, recounting his conversion, says, I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. Okay? It's not of human origin. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. So it didn't originate with man, and it wasn't even communicated through men. The authority that I have, the message that I proclaim, the office that I hold is from Jesus Christ. I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is at the foundation of the, the apostolic proclamation of the gospel. When you hear people today that try and lure people away from the gospel, what is it that they're often doing? other than pointing you to men and to what allegedly came through men, right? What is Paul ultimately resting this all on? Uh, think, for example, of, of Pappas and the, the ortho bros, right, out there, who love to talk about the church as though it's superior to the word of Christ, as though it's superior to the Bible, right? As if the church gave us the Bible, Right, rather than the word of God creating the church, it's the church in their mind that created and therefore lords it over the Bible. Okay, remember, I mean, Paul says in Romans 10, for example, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What is it that creates faith in the heart? It's the proclamation of the word of God. This is what. Uh, causes the, the church of Christ 
to form and grow and spread and so forth. It's the Word of God that, that uh, produces this. The Word is the seed. And, and Paul is here saying that the gospel that he's preaching can't be contravened by any person, no matter who they are or where they come from. Remember, the, the, the people that went down into Antioch that Paul opposed, that Peter committed hypocrisy with, the people that came down said they came down from James and the other elders of the church in Jerusalem, the mother church, and they then had the gospel from these men. And who could be more important than these men? Okay. They had the gospel from these men. And what does Paul do? Paul opposes them. Paul opposes Peter for engaging in hypocrisy with them and, and giving some credence to their false theology, their false gospel. Okay. Paul did not for a minute think that the Bible was subordinate to the church. He didn't think that the word of Christ, the head of the church, is somehow subordinate to the body. The word of Christ trumps all. The gospel that Christ, uh, that Paul proclaimed came from Christ. When you think of the, the, the gospel that Paul preached, you, you, you have to think about the one who is ultimately its origin and source, and you have to think of him precisely in terms of, of these Old Testament descriptions of God, right? The awesome vision that Ezekiel had of the Lord, the awesome vision or sight that Moses and the elders had of the Lord on Mount Sinai, this is the Christ that Paul encountered on the road to Damascus. That's why I don't care a rip about any of these people who, you know, uh, talk about muzzling me for proclaiming and defending the gospel. Do you seriously think that the exalted Christ, the king of the ages, the, the one who rides the divine chariot, that that Christ who stands behind this gospel, that do you seriously think that anything you say could move me or should move any of you from your the firm foundation on which you're standing? I mean, this is precisely Paul's point, okay? Paul's not just, I mean, he's not really bringing this up to make a point of Christology. That is, he's not trying to make a point about the identity of Christ. That's just assumed in what he's saying. But it gives all the more weight then to what he's saying. Back of this gospel is the Christ of Sinai, the Christ who appeared to Ezekiel at the Kabar River, right? The Christ who appeared to Isaiah and left him undone. The Christ who called Jeremiah. I mean, this is the Christ who authorized Paul as an apostle, and whose authority undergirds this gospel. Uh, all right, I could uh, we could go on and on here, and like I said, there's going to be a lot more. There's going to be a lot more on all of this. I, I always feel like, I mean, there, there's there are certain subjects that are not very difficult per se in themselves, but often to to understand them, you have to get into a bunch of other stuff before you can really, you know, talk about that. And it's sort of like, you know, all of us could can read uh, first grade level, right? Maybe in my case, fifth grade or uh, uh, kindergarten. I was trying to think of kindergarten, grade lower. Um, actually, when do you start learning to read? I don't know. But uh, you in order to to read even something basic, you have to learn the ABCs, right? So reading at a first grade level is basic, but so is so are your ABCs. The ABCs are more basic than reading at a first grade level. Can't read unless you have that. So these things are simple. I don't think that I'm saying anything too complicated, but there's just so much uh, interconnection here that to really enter into the depths of this, we have to have a lot of this in view. So next time we're going to look especially at Ezekiel 1 and Acts 26, okay? Ezekiel 1 and Acts 26, and have uh, further clarity or have further clarified what is behind the words that Paul uh, is saying when he speaks of uh, receiving this gospel directly from Jesus Christ. All right. Um, somebody said chick tracks. <laughs>
I take it, I take it that's an allusion to my old pal, my my old pal who used to believe this gospel, but uh, the Assyrian sh church shook its tail and he went chasing after it. And now apparently the he ch chased the tail, they're going to give him the boot, right? Apparently he's caused a ruckus over there. They don't want him no more. They're going to give him the boot. So now he's going to flip a coin and decide whether he's going to the Oriental Orthodox or the uh, Tohido Church or the Roman Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church, right? Uh, roll the dice. Um, but he, back in the day when he was uh, making the big jump, uh, he uh, he said that his experience for 20 years as a Protestant, that the, the depth of his study pr primarily consisted of things like chick tracks. <laughs> so he's kind of gotten away with murder just because of a good memory. He's He's been able to like re reference things, but in, in terms of his actual uh, study and, and uh, competence and so forth, it didn't rise higher than a chick track. Now I'm not putting down chick tracks. I think they can be useful, right? For introducing people, getting them thinking uh, some of them, some of them are wild, but uh, this is your life. That's a pretty standard, useful track, I think. But it's certainly not where any Christian should be after 20 years, right? <laughs> um, anyways. Uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, Breakfast Gun says, why does Rome believe that the Immaculate Conception was necessary? If Mary could have been conceived without original sin, uh, though her parents were... Why wouldn't Jesus be conceived without original sin, though his parents? So it sounds like, so it's often observed. So some 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 people have argued on the Roman side. Papists have argued that in order for Jesus to be born without contracting the corruption that comes from Adam, well, then his mother had to be immaculately conceived. Otherwise, he would inherit corruption from her. And the, the natural response to that sort of thing is, well, this would lead to an infinite regress. If Mary had to be sinless in order for Jesus to be born without sin, then her mother and father would have to have been sinless and so on and so forth, right? Uh, but first of all, the premise is wrong. Mary doesn't have to be sinless in order for Jesus to be sinless. That's the whole point of the virgin birth. Right? Why was Jesus conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit? Precisely because of what it says in Luke 1. Uh, the Holy Spirit right, is sanctifying him from the womb. He is being conceived without the agency of a man, so not by ordinary generation, through the supernatural agency of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And he says, therefore, the holy child that will be born of you shall be the Son of God, Right, to call the Son of God. The holy child, it's the, it's the supernatural work of the Spirit that causes Jesus to bypass receiving the corruption of sin. doesn't require any kind of immaculate conception. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that, I think that's the point Breakfast Gun is making. You know, if, if she could have been born to parents who were conceived in sin, then... Uh, I mean, if she could have born, been born immaculately that way, then why couldn't Jesus have been, right? So uh, there's an infinite regress on Rome's part. Uh, I forget how they try and wriggle out of that, but uh, it's unimpressive, as most of her heresies and their defenses are. Um, <laughs> poor Rome. Poor Rome. <laughs> All right. Um Let's see. So seasoned apologist here. Good to see you. Haven't seen you for a while. He said, thank you, Anthony, for what you do. When are we having you on seasoned apologist live again? It's hard to say. I'm a busy, busy guy. I'm not too good to be on the show, obviously. Love you guys. But uh, it's hard enough sometimes getting stuff prepared for this channel. And then I already have these commitments with George and then responsibilities to David and, uh, you know, uh, other stuff with Tony Costa. So it, it just, it, it sometimes gets uh, too involved. Sometimes a guy has to stop and read when he's not working. <laughs> so I don't know. I'll have to let you know at some point. It's just, it's just hard to keep up with everything. 
you are free to take any of my videos and put them on your channel if you want. So, uh, so Chaldeans, oh wait, where did that go? Where's Chaldean? So uh, he's obviously not paying as much attention. I'm not putting you down, Chaldean, but you know, you, you're obviously missing some things. You said just out of curiosity, would you be willing to debate Sam Shamoon on Calvinism? It's C L A L V I N I S M. Um, I see you guys bashing each other, but no debate is happening. Now, first of all, I've challenged Sam repeatedly, okay? But on the gospel, okay, one thing I've said before, I, I don't have much interest in debating somebody who's who doesn't even believe the gospel of Christ on other issues that I could debate with those who do believe the gospel, right? I have Christian brothers and sisters who don't agree with me on Reformed theology, I embrace them as my brothers and sisters, provided that their hope and confidence is in Christ alone. Okay, We can debate other issues in private conversation. Maybe there's a time when I'll say, hey, as a brotherly debate, I'll, I'll debate this person on that topic. I might do that sort of thing. But if we're talking about an apostate from the gospel, the only relevant issue between me and that person is the gospel. Okay, So I have challenged the apostate to debate me repeatedly repeatedly. I'm not just sitting over here bashing the guy and shrinking back from a debate. Okay? They're the ones calling people cowards who can't show up to the field of discussion. I'm here. I've been here. I've been here for nine months waiting for these guys. Okay, All, all the evil speech towards me. Now, I've said stuff. I, I've been uh, pointed in saying these guys, uh, uh, Sam's an apostate. Uh, William's not an apostate because he never believed the gospel, right? Uh, well, actually, I can take that back. I mean, William claims that he used to be reformed. I doubt that, but he says that, so maybe I should go with that. But I've challenged him. Let's debate the good news about Christ. That's the only thing that you really need to hear at this point. You're not going to be able to solve these other issues, right? You, your mind is too clouded to be able to think straight on these other matters. If you don't know something as foundational as the, I mean, think about it. I, I'm not being mean here. This again, I'm not just bashing on the guy. This guy has claimed to be an expert in the Bible for over two decades. Anybody who even slightly disagreed with him, he came down on them with a ton of bricks. Okay. But now think about it. This man's entire view of the faith has shifted. Not one doctrine, a whole host of doctrines. And not minor doctrines, major doctrines. And not just major doctrines that maybe are, are harder to get a handle on, but those things that Paul said, or at least the author of Hebrews said, were elementary, very simple, the milk of the word. Paul says that faith, for example, is an elementary teaching. This guy is all of a sudden, try, without any competence in the biblical languages, is running around saying he's figuring out a new definition of the word faith, one not found or supported by any lexicon, one that he wouldn't for the life of him try and defend against me in a debate. Right? There's no reason to listen to this guy. He, he's, he doesn't demand anyone's loyalty. The one who demands your loyalty is Christ. The gospel of Christ is where you need to put your feet. And you need to, to glue them there, right? You need to pray to the Spirit, hold my feet fast on this foundation. Don't make me unstable like this man. This man, remember, this man used to be a Syrian church of the East. Then he was nation of Islam, of all the dumb things to believe, especially if you're not even African-American. I mean, how does that appeal to somebody who's not? <laughs> then he professed to be an evangelical. Then Syrian church of the East. Now you're going to get the boot from there and go who knows where. This is an unstable man. You don't want to be following this guy and all of his fickle movements, his hopeless gyrations. Hold fast to Christ. Christ is all you need. Christ is all you need to justify you. Christ is all you need to sanctify you. Christ is the justifier of his people and the sanctifier of his people. But justification and sanctification are not the same thing. Faith does not mean faithfulness, though Christians are called to have faith and be faithful. But yeah, these are the these are the issues that Sam needs to talk about. Okay, these I mean, and really, in a sense, I mean, I could just simply write off Sam. The author of Hebrews doesn't have any very hopeful things to say about those who had a clear understanding of the gospel and then later denied it. Okay, so I may just as well say, hey, you know, th th I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I, 
on the one hand, I don't have high hopes. On the other hand, I do. I have high hopes in the sense that I want the best for him. I want him to believe in Jesus. Not, not the Christ of Rome or the, the Christ uh, the Christ of Scripture, whose death is sufficient to atone for sin, whose glorious resurrection and reception of the Spirit is sufficient uh, to uh, you know bring people to new life and all the rest. I mean, I want him to believe that with all everything in me. With Paul, I could say that you know I have deep sorrow in my heart over this. But I also don't have high hopes. You know, it's just like when a person, when two people who once professed love for each other later divorce, nine times out of 10, these two people hate each other. But that's just the way it is, right? It's great when you can get two people that are willing to uh, get along with each other for the sake of children or, or just decency and so forth. But nine times out of 10, when parties divorce, they hate each other. Sam has gone a whoring after a false gospel, and to use Paul's language by deserting that gospel Paul preached for a different gospel, he has deserted the one who called him by the grace of Christ. He's gone a whoring after a different gospel, and it's natural for somebody who's done that to have deep hostility for this message. Okay, That guy will, at the drop of a hat, without the slightest tinge of conscience, call the gospel a doctrine of demons, okay? That takes an especially hard heart, an especially darkened mind, an especially seared conscience, okay? I'm just trying to warn you people. This isn't for the sake of bashing anyone, okay? This gospel saves. This Christ deserves all your faith, okay? That man deserves nothing from you, okay? I I'm not asking for anything from you. You don't have nobody has to stand here and, and heap accolades on me. I don't expect anybody to call themselves Rogersians, you know, like Shamunians, you know, this little this cult, cult following of I'm not asking that from anybody. I want to die and be forgotten, as one person says, having preached the gospel and, and turned people's attention to Christ. That's my only desire. And 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 so that's my sincere exhortation to people. Believe the gospel. It doesn't rest on the authority of any man or church. The church is only authoritative when it speaks from Christ. Apart from that, she has no authority. She is to follow the, the word of her Lord, the church, not dictate to her Lord what his gospel is and, and has to be. Right? I saw the other day, by the way, I couldn't help but bring this up. Um, oops, what is this? Oh, does the church hold authority in interpreting the Bible? Okay, so... Certainly, God has established the church. We, we have to say a couple things here, though. First of all, what, what is the church? What does the word church mean? And it can be used in different ways in scriptures. More often than not, the word church in scripture refers to a particular local congregation. Okay, that's what it means more often than not. There are occasional times where the word church is used to refer to the universal body of people that profess faith in Christ, right? You actually see an example of that in Galatians 1. Um, when Paul says uh, in Galatians 1, let's see. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Um, so Paul says, uh, You have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure. Here, Paul's not referring to a particular church, right? He's just saying the church of God, the people of God. So there's an example of it being used in a broader sense. But none of these references particularly refer to Rome. Right. They're not it's not tying it to Rome and certainly not to a pope. Right. All that stuff is post biblical and it's not even, you know, first century. Right. I mean, the church does spread to Rome in the first century, but you don't have anything like a bishopric and all that kind of stuff there. And you certainly don't have Roman hegemony. They don't have hegemony over the rest of the church. I mean, these sorts of things just aren't there. The first point that I'm making is that Christ does establish a church. Particular churches are governed by elders. Okay. 
elders, not popes, not cardinals, not bishops in distinction from elders, elders. Okay. And among the elders, there's a pastor, right? The pastor is an elder, one of those who rules uh, and who's specially called to preach the word. And so, sure, the, the church is tasked with reading the word publicly because in the first century, everybody didn't have a copy. So you have explicit injunctions to read the word. Timothy is told to read the word in first Timothy uh, and exposit the word, explain the word, teach the word and train other men, pass this on to other men who are going to be reliable and faithful to teach these things to, to those after them as well. So you have this sort of thing in scripture. Do you get the impression from Scripture that the church is an infallible interpreter of Scripture? Absolutely not. If the church were an infallible in, uh, interpreter of Scripture, the New Testament makes absolutely no sense. The vast majority of the New Testament, including the epistle to the Galatians, is written to correct the church precisely because she's not being a very good infallible interpreter of Scripture. The church needs to be rebuked, corrected, reproved, instructed, and built up by Scripture, the Word of Christ. She's not to lord it over Scripture. She's to submit to Scripture. And so, yeah, the church has a function. It's just like parents, right? Uh, I'm a parent to my children. I have authority over them. I don't have absolute authority. I'm not infallible, right? So my children have a uh, certain responsibility to me, but there's also a sense in which my, my authority ends and can't go beyond certain things. So it's no different with the case of the church. The church's authority is delimited. It's delimited by the fact that it is the body of Christ. It's not the head of the body. Christ is the head. He's the only Lord of the church. The Pope of Rome at best is an antichrist, okay? trying to usurp the place of Christ. Okay, iQuick says, how do you understand James' point in James 4, 11 through 12? Okay, let me pull it up. Oops, I got this wire here in my way. Um, do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who's able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So first thing I would say with respect to, I mean, he says he's talking here about not speaking against one another brethren. OK, so that's the, the interpersonal relationship here is between brothers. OK, so biblically, that would mean those who affirm the gospel. So he's not talking about, uh, say, my my statements about Sam being an apostate, right? I, I'm not, you know, I'm not talking about somebody who's a brother in a common faith. He has a different Lord. He, he, he serves a, you know, believes in a different gospel. Okay. Uh, but between brothers, now it doesn't mean you're supposed to be mean to others, but I'm just pointing out here that it very clearly says, don't speak against one another. That's, that's who James has in view. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law. And the, the basic idea here is he's talking in context about uh, rich and poor, right? Uh, being proud or arrogant over others. Notice in the context, he says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members. You lust and don't have you. So you commit murder. You are envious and can cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your gloom to, to, or your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. So all of this, I'm not going to go back and read the rest of the epistle, but all of this is part of the uh, buildup from earlier chapters where Paul is talking about people showing favoritism. Uh, to the rich and despising the poor and the rich looking down on the poor. 
And the law puts men on an equality before God in terms of piety and so forth. And so all people are to be uh, judged equally before the law. And those who judge others, number one, on the basis of their economic status or things like that, are judging the law. They're, they're, they're in effect saying that the law is wrong to put them on an equality, right? So that's part of what is going on here in uh, James. But also the idea of your brother who is in Christ and therefore forgiven of his sins, justified before God, an heir of eternal life, the idea of condemning your brother who is in Christ uh, involves uh, necessarily uh, a kind of judgment that should be off the table. Right? That kind of judgment should be off the table. A, a believer should not be judging another believer uh, in that way. Uh, in, in effect, he is uh, setting aside the gospel and uh, uh, violating, uh, I mean, setting aside the gospel. I mean, if you're going to say that your brother is not, uh, is condemned, then you're removing him from the gospel and speaking from the position of, of the law. And then that same law then would condemn you. Right. The same law by which you're condemning your brother is the same law that uh, condemns you. So hopefully that helps. Off the cuff. Uh, Dave says, Rabbi Singer accuses Paul of not citing any scriptures in his letter to the Corinthians, where he says Jesus died and rose according to the scriptures. What scriptures was Paul referring to? So actually, last episode, I talked about this a little bit. And... I mean, first of all, when he says he accuses Paul, I mean, I'm not, I don't mean your wording, but I'm, when, when Singer says he doesn't quote any scriptures, right? This is actually, I mean, reflects poorly on Singer because Paul, a first century Jew, considered this such a simple and basic matter that he didn't have to cite it to prove it to anybody. Everybody just could take it for granted. They knew it. And here's Singer the expert Jewish rabbi who needs Paul to spell it out for him, right? <laughs> He's so dull and uninformed with respect to the scriptures that because Paul didn't say it, well, I don't know what Paul's talking about. This just shows the, I mean, I, I oftentimes wonder, I mean, when I listen to singer, I'm thinking, does this, it, it it's not possible to me in my mind. I'm, I mean, there's a little possibility, but it, it's, it's very hard to believe that singer is not aware of some of the stuff that, I could easily quote off the top of my head. He can't be ignorant of all of it, right? But if, if he is ignorant, of, so he's either lying or he's ignorant of it. And if he's ignorant of it, why is he speaking so bombastically? Why is he pontificating? It doesn't make any sense. Singer would be, I'm not going to go through all this because you can listen to the last episode, but here's one example of a three, a third day, text that's relevant to the the resurrection of Christ. The Akita, the, the term used for the binding of Isaac. In Genesis 22, which is foundational to Judaism. In fact, according to many Jewish sources, it was the offering up of Isaac that made subsequent sacrifices on Moriah, where the temple was built, effectual. That's where Abraham took Isaac. And so they often look back to the merits of that event and say, this is what underlies all these sacrifices and makes them effectual. They don't know how rightly they speak, but yet wrongly at the same time. This is the text where you have a father taking his son and offering him as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Okay. Thousands of years later, another father was going to offer up his son on that same mountain as a sacrifice, right? So Abraham's commanded to take a son, and his son is specifically called his beloved son. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and offer him as a sacrifice uh, on the, one of the mountains that I'll show you. The word used there for only is yachid, yachid. Whenever, that was trans, whenever that's translated, it's, it's used 12 times in the Old Testament. Whenever it's translated into Greek, it always is translated either by monogenes or agapetas or agapetas, right? Monogenes, 
or managenes, means only begotten. Agapitas means beloved. These are the terms that the gospel writers use to refer to Jesus. When Mark, Matthew, uh, Luke refer to Jesus at his baptism as God's beloved son, or when the father says that, it's the same term. What it's saying is, this is God's beloved son. This is the one who's come to be the sacrifice for sins, right? That's why Jesus is proclaimed by John to be the Lamb of God, because he has come, the Father has declared from heaven, this is my beloved son. Now, John uses the, the term monogenes, right? The other term to represent this. What's interesting is the first and last reference or use of this term, the first is Genesis 22, in reference to Isaac, a clear foreshadowing of the Messiah. And the last occurrence is Zechariah 12.10. Zechariah 12.10 says, They'll look upon me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as for an only son. Agapetas huias, the beloved son. Right? They're going to mourn for him as for an only son. In connection with God saying that he himself is going to be pierced. Right? First and last occurrence of this word, accidental? Think not. In fact, here's another occurrence of the word. In Amos 8, God says to the people of Israel that he's going to turn their festivals into mourning, their new moons, right? Their Passover celebrations. He's going to turn them to mourning. He's going to cover the heavens with sackcloth, right? He's going to cause the sun to go dark at midday, right? At noon, midday. And cause it to be an occasion of mourning as for an only son. So again, another reference to an only son, begotten one, right? Only begotten or only beloved son. The sun's going to go dark. Elsewhere, we're told the Lord would be pierced and it'd be a time of mourning for an only son. Here we're told the sun's going to go dark at midday. Jesus died. Uh, well, he was put on the cross at uh, 9. Then the sun goes dark at noon, and he dies at three, right? And by our reckoning, the sun goes dark literally at midday. And what does the centurion at the cross say, by the way? Uh, it's, it's remarkable in Mark's gospel, nobody confesses Jesus as the sun except for the demons and Jesus. It, but it takes the cross before the centurion, a man, finally says, surely this was the son of God. Right, He saw the heavens going dark. Perhaps he knew that prophecy in Amos 8. And he mourned as for an only son. Anyways, um, why did I bring all this up? Well, here in Genesis 22, you have one of the most important third-day references in all of Scripture. The Akita is foundational to Judaism. And it, the, the text goes out of its way to make it clear that Isaac was received back by Abraham on the third day. Okay, when the commandment came, Isaac was as good as dead. It wasn't until three days later that Isaac was received back by Abraham. And the Jews even speak of it as if Isaac literally died, right, and rose again. So here you have a third day reference, and it's not the only one. You've got the reference in uh, to Jonah, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Right, like Jonah. Jonah describes his uh, situation in the belly of the fish as three days in Sheol. Right, he, he's in Sheol for three days and night. Uh, I mean, you've got all, all sorts of references of significance all throughout Scripture. But I, I discuss it more on that previous broadcast. But there's also an article written. I so I think last time I guessed that it was like. Um, three to six years ago, I think, but it was actually in 2014 that I was remembering. In 2014, if you look up the Westminster Theological Journal, and I'm looking it up right now as we talk, uh, Westminster Theological Journal and Third Day, and uh, it didn't pull it up this time. Let me see. Hold on. Oh, maybe this is it. Maybe this is it. From site to... No. Well, that might be relevant. I don't know. I'll, I'll have to put it in the description box. I'll put it in the description box if I can find it. All right. So... Thank you so much, Darcy. Hello to you, too. 
Hello, hello. Thank you so much. You are too kind. All right. Now, I tell people I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not snubbing. Oh wait, did I miss this? Oh no, I just saw that. <laughs> I'm not snubbing others that that can't give or whatever. It's just if somebody gives a super chat, I feel obligated to answer it. Um, so let me see if there's any questions here from others. Um, oh, King Danny's here. Uh, bro. First of all, we're not bros. <laughs> if you don't believe the gospel, you're lost. You need to repent and believe in Christ and his sufficiency to save. And you say there's multiple sessions of reputation on Calvinism on Sam's channel. Sam is a master at engaging in red herrings. Okay, You guys are like the, the foolish dogs that go chasing after the scent. I'm not using dogs there in, as a, in a pejorative way, right? You know what a red herring is in logic. In logic, a red herring is when somebody brings up an issue that's irrelevant to the issue in order to distract people, right? That's all Sam's ravings about Calvinism are. They're, they're ravings about something that I don't even talk about much. I, I am a, I put my head on the pillow every night because I believe in a sovereign God. So I, I don't mince words about it. I believe the God of the Bible is sovereign. And I believe he's able to accomplish his will without being the originator, right? The author of evil. Somebody can think that's contradictory. They can think it's un unbiblical. I'm convinced it isn't, right? But the issue with Sam is his denial of the gospel. I could have the debate on Calvinism with my fellow brothers and sisters any day of the week. It's the gospel that's relevant. It's everybody else who's running from the gospel like it's the plague, right? It's Sam Shamoon, you guys' hero, who's running and won't debate the matter. And yes, you could go tell him that. He already knows that. He's hiding it from you guys, but I've challenged him repeatedly. He knows it. All right. Um, he says, apostolic Christians versus Reformation. You might as well say Judaizers, right? The Judaizers are ancient. They go back to the Jerusalem church, right? <laughs> versus Reformation Christians, which is just to say Christians who anchor their belief on the sure testimony of Scripture. Your, your gospel's not in the Bible, right? That's why you guys always want to talk about history. But history is judged by the Bible. The Bible's not judged by history. The Bible is the Word of God. And as the Word, I mean, think about it. I mean, it's just patently absurd for people to give supremacy to a institution created by God's Word. As if, you know, God's Word created the world. God's Word is not subject to the world. God's Word creates the church. It's not subject to the church. You guys need to get your priorities straight. <laughs> it's absolutely just. I, anyways, I better I better stop interacting on that. It, 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 it takes a special kind of blindness. I'm telling you. I quick says, are you a partial preterist? Yes, I am. In fact, I was just reading a book refuting. Full preterism. So I absolutely reject full preterism. Uh, but Steve Gregg just came out with a book. See that? I'm reading a book by a guy who's not a Calvinist. <laughs> I can learn from people who aren't Calvinists. <laughs> uh, but he wrote a book, Why, full, Why Not Full Preterism? So uh, I, I've interacted with preterists, not online, but outside of this context for over 25 years. So uh, I still keep up a bit of an interest in that just because I know some people that have fallen for that movement. Um, but, uh, I don't, so Abyssinia church says, could you give some, me some idea how Christian canon is so differ? So, um, I'm not exactly sure what you are asking about. Like, are you, I don't know if you're asking, you know, what's the difference between the Protestant canon, uh, the canon of the Papists, the canons of the Eastern Orthodox, the uh, canon of, you know, the Tahito Church or the, I don't even know if I say that right, the Oriental Orthodox. These groups have different canons. The, the, the one true church, <laughs> the one true church, and you know, the Roman Catholic one true church and the Eastern Orthodox one true church and the, uh, Arith, you know, <laughs> all these different one true churches have different canons, right? You know that, right? Um 
the thing is that the canon embraced by Protestants is the canon that was embraced by the Jews to whom the oracles of God were given, Romans 3, right? How are the Jews given the oracles of God and expected to believe what God says and do if they don't know what those books are, right? They had these books. They knew what they were. Jesus and the apostles used the same canon, the 39 books of the Protestant canon, okay? They quote from those three divisions. They quote from most of the books in those divisions, Right. But they were Jews. And Paul explicitly says he's a Pharisee. Right. There's never any indication of a dispute between Paul and the Pharisees over the extent of the canon or any of this. Right. It, it's uh, it's beyond certain that their canon consisted of what Protestants hold to today. Now, interestingly, um, well, I mean, I don't want to get too much into all that, but that that's that's the gist of it. Um, you know, there's there's no authoritative citation of the canon uh, of anything beyond what's what Protestants consider canonical. Uh, you you have uh, now this isn't to say that writings outside the canon that there aren't any that are useful religious works, right? There are things that tell us things about how Jews viewed things, you know, certain groups of Jews at least. Uh, and there's no problem even with the New Testament alluding to something in, in some of those books. Some things are just matters of historical knowledge. And just because we say something's not inspired, like the apocryphal books, doesn't mean that they don't contain any true information. Uh, they're just not uh, God-breathed, right? They're not infallible, inspired, inerrant, life-giving. They don't have that those, those qualities. Uh, and so the New Testament might allude to something that might be known from those books, but it never quotes them as scripture, never quotes them as the final word on anything, never says they're God breed, nothing like that. And uh, Paul even quotes pagan poets, uh, right? In Acts 17 on Mars Hill, Paul quotes pagan poets. Jude quotes the book of Enoch, even though no Christian includes that in their canon, except I think the Ethiopian church does. I think it's the Ethiopian church. Anyways, so... Those are some brief thoughts on the canon. But if you want to read something, I've been reading it recently. I don't know where it is. I've been reading Steve Christie's book on the canon. And I'm enjoying it. So I've read books for years on the canon. And I'm actually really, really enjoying it. So, I mean, I'm, I mention this because, you know, often when you read a lot of books on a particular topic, the next book on the topic has less chance to impress you because it's likely that a lot of the stuff that they bring up has already been brought up. And so I, I'm pleasantly surprised at reading uh, Steve Christie's book uh, because it hasn't just left me with the impression that I'm just reading the same old stuff that I've seen before. Uh, it, it's doing a really good job of, of bringing out things and uh, filling in detail. So uh, I recommend that book to you. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, Diner Review says, yes, Messianic Jews also affirm this canon. Now, I'll tell you, so here's here's something funny. So, uh, so King Danny says, why do rabbinical Jews have authority over the canon over the other church? First of all, nobody said anything about rabbinic Jews. <laughs> Jesus was a Jew. Paul was a Jew. Uh, they weren't rabbinic Jews. The term rabbinic ordinarily refers to the Talmudic period, the post-Christian period. And that's not what I'm appealing to. And if you think the uh, the proof that the canon was restricted to these books is post-Christian and there's nothing before that, you're out to lunch and, and aren't familiar with the material. But uh, the fact of the matter is, it, it, and see, this is just another example that Catholics read things through Catholic lenses. When I appeal to the Jews, I'm not repeal, appealing to them as the authorities over the canon. That wasn't my point. I, notice what I said. I said, Romans 3 says, to them the oracles of God were given, okay? And so they are precisely the people who could be expected to have recognized the canon. I didn't say anything about them having authority to determine the canon. They were the ones who received these books. They didn't authoritatively put their stamp on them and make them the word of God. That's a papist blunder, okay? That's not a, that's not a biblical idea, and that's not what I said. I'm simply pointing out the fact that the Bible says that God revealed himself to the Jewish nation. In the Psalms, God says he revealed himself to Israel and to no other nation. That's the nation he revealed himself to. Paul says in Romans 3 that to them were committed the oracles of God. Were committed. God committed the oracles of God to them. Okay? Jesus and the apostles 
in suit with all that we know of Second Temple Judaism and so forth, appeal to precisely this canon and to nothing beyond it as authoritative canonical scripture. So uh, you've turned things on their heads, right? Like take off the papal lenses. That's all I'm asking, at least. I mean, you could still hold on to your air. You could put your glasses back on. But if you're trying to think through the issue and think through it rightly, at least how we're viewing it, you have to take those lenses off, right? Um, but uh, one of the things I'm going to say, uh, I was going to say, so I did this thing on the canon. It was intended as an introduction, okay? And Sam, once again, had to farm out the task because, again, not studied on these matters. So you got Gary Machuda. And all the people that Sam has had on, I like Gary. But I do find it quite disquisitive that he would be associated with that crowd because he's such a easygoing kind of guy, right? I find that a bit strange, but maybe he's just thinking uh, this is a platform for me to get out my message or whatever. Okay. I think you should look into the people that he's associating with better, but Hey, okay. Setting that aside, got Gary Machuda to respond to this. So him and William, the William who doesn't have time to debate me can constantly do these shows responding to me. Right? <laughs> so William Albrecht and Gary Machuda did this video where they're responding to me. I just did an introduction and I didn't, I didn't listen to all their stuff, but I think they've done like two or three videos on it. And I never listened to this stuff because I'm thinking it's not relevant till it's relevant. Unless these people want to debate, it's not relevant for me to listen to it. And uh, the fact is, they're not willing to debate, right? I think Gary Machuda will debate the canon, but that's down the road. Uh, I have to, you know, it's first, there's an order here. First, Sam's chosen man, William Albrecht. Then Cobain, who's Perry's chosen uh, defender, and uh, then uh, maybe Machuda. Or I'd like to get Robertson Jennison there uh, because I actually think he's more competent on at least something like sola fide to to represent the Roman side, right? But um, where was I going with this? Um, Oh, uh, yeah. So they, they did this thing where, so I just did an introduction and then they're, they're putting out these videos and I'm thinking how funny, like I can keep these guys so busy. Right. And then I go to sleep without even listening to 10 minutes of their stuff. <laughs> how mean am I? Right. <laughs> and, and then I get people like King Danny. He hasn't responded to them. Hasn't responded to who these people that don't, ha they're not convinced enough to defend their position in public debate. These guys claim to be apologists. Sam Shamoon, right? Sam Shamoon, William Albrecht. All these guys claim to be apologists. What do apologists do? Well, <laughs> it's not what these guys are doing, right? So anyways, um, I I did an intro. They, they did several videos. I don't even know how, how many they did. And... Uh, but I didn't even bring up some of the, I actually think a lot of the intro stuff is devastating as it is, honestly. And I know the, the, the attempts to make an end run around all that, but I wasn't addressing all that in the video, all the, all the excuses. Right. But there's some other stuff that's been coming out recently that most people wouldn't be familiar with unless they're deeply involved in biblical theology, meaning not systematic theology, but biblical theology, which, it deals with things like the shape of the canon and stuff like that. I mean, this this material is huge. And so one of the things I'm inter I am interested in debating this topic, and I think it'll bring out something that isn't well known. And uh, you can pass this on, King Danny, because uh, the sources I'm talking about here aren't likely people aren't going to figure out what <laughs> they're not going to figure out what I've uh uh, been, been looking at, but anyways, um, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff about shape of the canon, the, the order and arrangement of the books and that kind of thing. But I really would like to debate that at some point. So I probably will. Uh, so King Danny, James Light is low level. Okay. Um, so Thamadzo says, does it have to do with Gerhardus Voss? No, this is this is stuff that people have been discussing more recently. 
I'm not going to say Voss doesn't say anything relevant to it, but um, this has more to do with the fact that I'll give you an example. Okay. It's not going to per se talk. You know, I'm not going to get into the Canon thing, but I'm going to give you a, a kind of an idea of, of what's involved here. It used to be believed that the Psalter was a haphazard collection of, even if somebody believed they were inspired songs or prayers, right? It was often thought that there was no real rhyme or reason for the order, the arrangement of the Psalter. And so you'll, that, I mean, that affects exegesis. What has recently become more appreciated is the fact that the Psalter is a deliberate arrangement. I mean, not just a, a haphazard collection. And, and just think broadly here, the very fact that the Psalter consists of five books, right? Go look at Psalm 1. At the beginning of Psalm 1, it says book 1. Okay, if you go to the end of, hold on, if you go to the end of Psalm, bring it up real quick. Um, sometimes these online Bibles don't, don't do what they should. Don't appreciate when they leave out. Okay. So if you go to the end of Psalm 41 or the beginning of Psalm 42, it says book two, right? And so on through the Psalter. So there are five books of the Psalter. And there are, this is, you know, just this is similar to the observation that Matthew's gospel has five major sermons in it, right? And so a lot of people draw a analogy to Moses and the Torah and similarly between the Psalter and the Torah. And there are all sorts of uh, other reasons that go in with making that connection. Uh, but one is that the, 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 the Psalter is filled with references to the, the Torah and the importance of the Torah and meditating on the Torah. In fact, the first Psalm, the introduction to the Psalter, it says, how blessed is the man, right? And then it goes on to describe the blessed man as someone who meditates in God's law day and night, right? And, and notice the... Uh, in, in, in the arrangement of the Bible, um, what comes, hold on a second. Uh, so I, I don't want to confuse everybody, but th there's a different arrangement. I, I should have mentioned this. There's a different order of the books in the Hebrew Bible than in uh, subsequent uh, orderings in, in the church. And so the Hebrew Bible is specifically what I'm talking about. There's a significance to the arrangement of things like the Psalms, which is easily missed. And so, for example, right, it's it's easy to read Psalm 1 independently of Psalm 2 or vice versa. But once you realize that the Psalter is a deliberate composition, that these things aren't haphazardly arranged, that there is some order to it, you start to recognize then the possibility that a, a psalm before or after a psalm might be relevant to the psalm. And Robert Cole wrote an excellent book on the first two psalms of the Psalter, pointing out that really both psalms are about the Messiah. And really the Psalter should be read as a messianic text. The, the two psalms at the beginning are the introduction to the whole uh, Psalter. And so he points out, for example, that in in Psalm 1, it says uh, that the righteous man, right, doesn't... I mean, it's interesting. If you, if you look at the first half of the psalm, it talks about the righteous man. The second half of the psalm, it talks about the wicked. What's interesting is the righteous man is always singular, always referring to one, and it's not a collective is, is the argument here. But when it talks about the wicked, it's plural. So there's this contrast between the one righteous person and the wicked. Okay, This righteous one does not sit in the seat of scoffers. The question is then, where does he sit? Psalm 2 speaks of the one who sits in heaven and laughs at those who, who scoff, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's laughing and having them in derision. Uh, Psalm 1 speaks of the law being his meditation, but literally in the Hebrew, it says, the law, uh, uh, his, the law, or his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. The literal Hebrew indicates 
that his law, when it says in his law, he meditates day and night, it's referring to the Torah, but it's referring to it as his law, the righteous man. Who Then who is the righteous man? If the Torah is his Torah, if he's not seated in the seat of scorners and, and so forth, I mean, it all just sort of leads to the idea that Psalm 1 is about the Messiah just as much as Psalm 2 is about the Messiah. Moreover, it's it's pretty obvious that there's an inclusio between the two psalms. The first psalm begins by saying, blessed is the man. And then Psalm 2 ends by saying, blessed are all who trust in him. So meaning the Messiah, the, the king, the son, right? So observations like this are relevant to the determination of the canon. When you look at the Hebrew canon, it's masterful, right? It, the Hebrew canon itself speaks messianically. I'm talking about the arrangement of the books, the, the order of the books, the relationship of each book to each other, how one follows the other. It's all significant. And this is something that uh, uh, scholars have been seeing. And, and when you throw in the apocryphal book, it makes a mess of things. Okay, Not to mention they're a mess themselves. But when you throw in the apocryphal books, it makes a mess of things. Uh, but that's all... Um, King Danny or King Servant. I thought it was King Danny. <laughs> Used to seeing King Danny complaining over here. Um, <laughs> he says, King, oh, I got to see this. Uh, King Danny says, look at the comments of Steve's debates. Protestants are leaving because of him. <laughs> you guys are always so impressed by that sort of thing. <laughs> it's always been, it always amazes me. Like I, I used to watch the Dean show, the uh, Islamic thing, right? And one of the things this guy's always trying to do is he's always trying to get these celebrities who are Muslims, right? Because this is, you're, you're supposed to think Islam's true because these celebrities believe it, right? And uh, so sometimes, like, he'll be talking to some guest who's not a well-known individual, and he'll say, do you know that guy's a, a Muslim, you know? <laughs> it, it, it's a really weird thing to me. Like, I've never found that sort of thing impressive. But, yeah, there are always these, like, stragglers who are, I mean, I watched this guy the other day who once was a Protestant, watching a debate between a Protestant and an Eastern uh, person. And the Eastern person during the debate, right? It was on Sola Scriptura. The Eastern person during the debate is holding up these pictures of different saints. <laughs> Just reminded me of trading cards, right? <laughs> I'm thinking, I'll give you a Justin Martyr uh, trading card for your uh, for a Babe Ruth, right? <laughs> but here he is, you know, part of his you know little thing, he's like pulling out these cards. I mean, he venerates these things, right? Uh, and, and believes they make him more pious and get him closer to God and all that kind of stuff. I, I think they hold no value, right? I think they're pieces of wood, right? You can burn them. You can light your fires, right? You could cook if you had enough of them, right? <laughs> you, you, could, you could play games. You know, you could shuffle them, write numbers on them. That's all they're really good for, right? They, they contribute nothing to piety or anything else. Well, anyways, uh, there was this guy in there that used to identify as a Protestant, and he was parroting the same dumb arguments I've heard from Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox for ages. And I think, how does somebody fall for such an easily falsifiable or refutable argument, right? He said things like, how do you know what the canon of scripture is unless the church tells you? And I'm thinking, none of these one true churches agree with each other. Are you serious, right? And, and think about it. The Eastern church didn't have a clue what to do with the book of Revelation for over a millennia, right? And you still get Eastern people saying they don't know if it's canonical or is it canonical? You know, you could open up the... Uh, Orthodox study Bible will say it's canonical. You go to another source and it'll say it's not canonical, right? Uh, uh, the book of James, it was late in its reception in the Western church. They couldn't figure it out. Then, Where's this infallible tradition that they supposedly had to figure these things out? That's not how the canon was determined. Had nothing to do with these sorts of things, right? And, But anyways, I mean, parroting the same dumb thing, and I think I'm not impressed by that, right? You could tell me a billion people became Catholic overnight, Five billion. You could tell me everybody on the planet became a papist overnight, except for me. And guess what? Guess what my feet are going to stand on? Paul sent not from man nor through man, but Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Right? I neither received this gospel from man nor was I taught it, but received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only foundation for your faith. If your faith is resting on the testimony of any man or church, 
as though it were the ultimate and impregnable foundation for your feet, you are of all men most miserable. Your faith needs to rest upon the word of Christ. That's the rock on which the church itself rests. Sure, the church holds up this truth as well, but it also is itself built on, prior to that, the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Um, okay, so Archbishop says, Slam was trying to get me to look at a previous... Uh, yeah, Berean is here reminding me, telling me that I'm on too long. So I'm probably going to get off soon, but let me find this super chat. Um, oh, okay. So iQuick says, I'm convinced that James 5, 7 through 9 is about 80, 70. You know, it's interesting about James. So, of course, the epistle of James is not written by the brother of John, right? This is the James identified as the Lord's brother, right? So the 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 James who's John's brother was uh, killed early, right? And it, that, that's recorded in the book of Acts. James, the Lord's brother, lives into the 60s. So you know, by the way, that if if James was written by James, I, and of course I believe that it was, then you already know the book was written before 8070, right? If James, the author, died before 8070, then the book was written before 8070, right? Simple logic. Well. When you look at the accounts of James' martyrdom, which you find in Hegesippus, uh, Eusebius, other places, it mentions James, the Lord's brother. He's, he's called James the Just, right? That's how Jews referred to him. They considered him a righteous man. And certain Jews who had come to Jerusalem Right? Remember, Jerusalem's the, the center of attention, uh, especially on festival occasions. There would be throngs of Jews uh, in, in, the, in, in Jerusalem during festival occasions. So much so that really when you look at the destruction of Israel in AD 70, that Israel was swelling. I mean, the Jerusalem area was swelling with people at that time. So it's almost like she was ripe for the slaughter, right? It's not just that God sent the Romans to destroy Israel but that he sent it to destroy uh, that area at precisely the time when her numbers were swelling, right? So it was an especially gruesome slaughter. So much so that Josephus can talk about blood flowing up to, I'm, I'm using the language of Revelation, but he talks about how you couldn't you know, walk through certain areas without blood being all the way up your pant legs and stuff like that. Well, anyways, um, in, in these accounts of James' martyrdom, the Jews go to James and they say, hey, James, you know, you have authority with these people. Stop them from worshiping Jesus and and uh, and, and all that. Right. Say something to the people to to stop them from all of this. And so what they do is they, they take James up to a pinnacle of the temple with the intention of James, you know, telling people to stop with respect to Jesus, uh, their their confidence in him and all that. And what James does instead is he goes up to the top of the temple and he looks up and he says, he, he says, I see the son of man who is about to come. Okay. So James doesn't just speak of seeing the son of man, according to these accounts, right? Take them for what you will. He doesn't just speak of seeing the son of man like Stephen. But he says that the Son of Man is poised to come. His coming is soon. Okay, it's only a few. This was in AD 62. It's only a short period after that that the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem. The war began, right? Three and a half years uh, before its destruction, uh, the war had begun. And uh, but the, the the point is, so you here you have an external attestation to this teaching of James that he's he's expecting a coming in judgment from the son of man the son of man is going to judge Jerusalem now of course that's not the second coming I don't believe that's the second coming and I think there is a second coming Christ is coming again he's going to judge the world he's going to raise the dead he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth all that stuff is uh, decidedly biblical but there's a lot in scripture that does relate to the destruction of of Israel and the temple in 8070. It, it was certainly momentous. In fact, 
Yeah. Well, anyways, I, I could keep going on some of this, but uh, I've already been here apparently for four and a half hours. I don't know when to quit. Um, but uh, uh, let's see. Hold on. All right. Yeah. All right, people. I hope this was a blessing to you. Uh, my, my main interest, my main hope for you is that you'll be thoroughly grounded, your feet firmly fixed on Christ, the author and finisher of your faith. Don't listen to the voice of strangers. Christ is all sufficient. It's Christ who proclaimed this gospel, who authorized Paul to preach it. It's not ultimately dependent on any man or church. The church is called to be faithful to this message, to proclaim this message. And when she veers from this message, she's rebuked by this message. Right? Christ is the Lord of the church. Christ's word is the, the norm or standard of her faith. I hope it was a blessing to you. May the Lord bless you. And I'll see you next time, Lord willing.